von 2013 im Ghost Gym in Venice. Und damals habe ich mir schon gedacht, das wäre mal geil, wenn du es schaffst, den nach Deutschland zu holen. Und jetzt, siehe da, ein paar Jahre später habe ich das geschafft, dank euch. Weil, ähm, ja, weil ihr so zahlreich erschienen seid, kann man sich so Sachen äh, erlauben. Und äh, Dankeschön nochmal an euch. Ja. Und ähm, wer war letzte Woche in Frankfurt dabei? Aber noch einige. Ihr wisst, was letzte Woche in Frankfurt abging. Und äh, jetzt haben wir hier Mr. Tom Platz, eine Legende. Ähm, ich habe ihm eben am ersten schon gesagt, wir hatten für mich einen absoluten Sonderstatus. Ähm, er war zwar nie Mr. Olympia, aber Tom Platz ist einfach ja, eine Legende, hat einen Sonderstatus. Und ich hoffe, äh, ihr empfangt ihn jetzt standesgemäß, also macht noch ein bisschen Kraft. since uh, 1986 when I retired, which makes me think, uh, well, I'm shocked. First of all, I'm shocked. Um, I'm amazed that most of you probably were, weren't born when I retired, you know? <laughs> Closer, real close. Okay, most of you weren't. <laughs> this is like, like, like Lady Gaga right here. <laughs> okay. Can you, I can sing too. No, I can't sing. Uh, but most of you, uh, I was saying that probably you, were, you were, weren't born yet when I retired from bodybuilding, uh, which amazes me. It amazes me that you know me from all these years. I mean, Germany, Germany is like coming home. Uh, I love coming to Germany. Uh, my grandmother uh, came from Austria, not Germany, Austria. So I'm used to the German you know, language and it feels like home. Uh, I feel like I'm a little kid again. And, uh, it's fun to be here, but thank you very much for your great reception and uh, being so friendly and so warm. It means a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to make this, I mean, I have an agenda. I've been doing a, a, my last world tour. I told my wife I wanted to go around the world one more time. And I'm going to go to every country there is, and I think I'm going to stay home, stay home more. But I wanted to come to Germany, of course, most definitely. But I want to make this about you, and I want you to think about things that you want to talk about. I get a feeling there's things that you would like to talk about, you know, like the hair. Or, no, I'm joking. Okay. <laughs> but um, nobody has hair anymore. All the bodybuilders, don't ha all the men don't have hair, you know. Everybody's bald, but the girls still have hair. How come the girls don't lose, go bald? I don't understand that. But uh, back in my day, we all had hair and we all had an image. We all had a character. It was like wrestling. You know, I mean, Joe Weider one time told me, he said, when I first started, I just turned pro. He said, I want the, you should make your hair blonde like it was in the summertime. And I'm like, Joe, why? He goes, no, no, it's a good idea for you. He, he had the idea. And of course, uh, I was emulating Dave Draper, who a lot of you know, who was the Arnold before Arnold. But bodybuilding has been very good to me. It's been very good mentally. Physically, spiritually, financially, you know, everything I wanted bodybuilding to be, it was. Uh, I never got the Olympia trophy, though, you know, never got the Olympia trophy. And I, I would not trade the Olympia trophy for what I do have. Uh, it's been 37 years since I retired. and I'm still working. I'm working more now than I did when I was competing. So it's interesting. But I did leave. I did leave bodybuilding. Most of you understand me. Am I talking too fast? That's OK. It's good. Okay, slow me down if, I'm, if I get too fast. But everybody speaks English nowadays, huh? No, no problem, okay. Um, 
I left bodybuilding about 15 years ago. I said to myself, it's the past, it's the old days. And uh, I decided uh, to get a real job, okay? And I never had to get a real job. I just, you know, I, was, I came to California, I graduated from school, and uh, I won the universe, turned professional, and that was about 10 Mr. Olympias, and then uh, I retired, public speaking, everywhere I went, I could show my legs, and people said, now that you're retired, just come on stage, show your legs, and I was like, I was like a striptease person for a long time, you know. <laughs> Finally, uh, a number of years ago, I said, no more legs, no more, you know, I have to do something different. But I went into the corporate world. I wanted to get a job in the corporate world and interview. I actually put a suit coat on and I interviewed for a job. I didn't want Arnold to give me a job. I didn't want to, I wanted to know what it's like to be a normal guy, okay? And really interview for a job, okay? I, want, I never had to do that, so I wanted to know. And so I went into the corporate world and I sat down with this beautiful woman, beautiful woman. I, I love a woman in power, oh wow, you know. <laughs> you know sexy and smart, oh my God, you know. <laughs> Guys are like, ah, oh, you know. Okay, we're like nuts. But she goes, her name was Rochelle. She goes, I don't know what to do with you. I, I don't know what to do with you. You really don't have a lot of experience in the office. You don't, you don't, you're not that good on computers. I said, no, but I can learn. I'm trainable. Okay, so I really wanted to get into the office. And I wanted to get into the corporate world and be a corporate recruiter. I wanted to recruit people for, for different positions. And so after about five, six, 10, 15 years, I was promoted, you know, but I didn't know computers. I wasn't raised with computers. I didn't know, I, w I was barely texting, barely. Okay, even that, I was like, I don't wanna do it. You know, let's make a call, let's call somebody, you know. Because we had no fax machines. There was no fax machines in 1980. 1985, I remember the first fax machine. Oh my God, I remember the first uh, answer machine. I called somebody's house and there was an answer machine. I could leave a message, you know. I'm like, wow, how cool is that, okay? <laughs> you know, so it, a lot's changed, but I had to learn computers. I had to really compete with 20 and 30 year old guys and girls and be fast, be super sharp. So I'd come in the office early, early in the morning. I'd stay late at night. And I was very uncomfortable. I was very nervous and I had to learn computers. And it was like the squatting, my new squat rack, learning computers, okay? And I, after about 15 years, I learned computers and I was faster than the 20 or five year old, 30 year old guy. I was fast, very fast. I had to, I had to really try hard, but I was faster and I got promoted. And finally, after about 15 years, uh, we're at Gold's Gym, Venice. And uh, my wife was with me. I had been married many times. I, I know. So, you know. I married the blonde beach bunny. Big mistake. Don't ever marry the blonde beach bunny, guys. Okay, that's not good. And then I got the big Italian girl with big long legs. And that's not good either. Okay, that was you know, looks good on you know. <laughs> but uh, and now I, uh, my wife Cha, she's French Polynesian. But we were in the Gold's Gym, visiting Gold's Gym, and I had to leave Gold's Gym. I mean, too many ex-wives, ex-girlfriends. It was a mess. So I, ha I had to leave for a long time. So I went back, everybody was gone. My wax wives are gone. They, they, I don't know where they, I don't wanna know, okay. Uh, and uh, my wife brought David Hoffman over to meet me, you know, I'm like, and David comes over, big smile, very great shape. And, I, and then my wife introduced me to David Hoffman and he was very personable. Uh, and so about a year later, um, he wanted to do a video for Team Andro. And I'm in, the, I'm in the office, I'm, bodybuilding is no more for me. I'm done, you know, I'm training on weekends, Saturdays. Uh, but uh, I said, okay, sure, let's, let's do a video with David Hoffman about squatting, okay, for Team Andro, Matthias. Uh, and I did the video and we didn't squat, we just talked about the shoes and talked about the mentality. And all of a sudden, that video went crazy viral all over the world, you know? And I'm, I'm in the office and I'm working and I'm getting requests to travel, to do seminars, to do motivational seminars, to come back to bodybuilding. I'm like, wow, this is like crazy. I mean, because of that, the, the, the power of the internet was like, you know, I'm, I'm retired in 1986. I made a comeback in 1995, and now here it is, 2014, I think it was, right? 2014, and I have the opportunity to come back to bodybuilding. I'm like, wow, I'm not going to guest pose, though. I'm not going to take my pants off anymore. I said, I have to, you know, I told my wife that. The last time I took my pants off is at our wedding. And I said, that's, that's it. I'll do one more leg shot, one more leg shot. Um, you know, 
she did the hula for me. And, but in any event, uh, it's amazing how that just a friendly video uh, with Matthias and Team Andro and, and David enabled me to you know, have another career in bodybuilding. This is the third time, okay? And uh, I remember I thought about it very seriously and I said, I can go back to bodybuilding. I can go back and really do seminars and motivational seminars. I'm even speaking to corporations about attitude and motivation. But it was very, very interesting to me and very meaningful. But I thought, I don't, I don't want to leave my office. I have to resign my corporate position. I have my, my name on the door, you know, and my, my CEO, my, my boss. He looked at me and he, he goes, well, early, before this happened, he said, I know, you, I know who you are. I know who you are. What are you doing here? I said, I want to learn. I want to learn everything I don't know about business. And he's, he's a kid. He's 37, 40 years old, 37 years old. And I'm, six, I'm 55 years old at that time. I'm 63 now. And I said, look, Dino is his name, like Dino the dinosaur. I said, I just want to learn. I want to learn all about business. I want to learn what you do. I want your job. Okay? He's like, okay. So he said, I'm going to invite you to all the meetings. So he brought me into all the meetings. He goes, you can do, in half a day, you can get this, everything that you're supposed to get done. And I, I know you. I know I used to do twice as much as I was supposed to do. It was like training, you know? So he, he showed me and he brought me into the meetings. I'm like, wow, how fast these guys are. They're really sharp. The way they talk, the way they communicate, it's like a special, different world beyond bodybuilding. I learned it. It was, it was my new world. It was my new squat rack. The business was, rather than a sweatsuit in the morning, I put my suit on, you know, and I went to the office. I loved it. I, it was almost like the gym, only it wasn't, but it was, it was like my own new gym. And I loved it so much. And I, but then I, my, my the CEO, my boss, Dino, said, if you don't go back to bodybuilding, if you don't go back home to what you love to do, I'm going to fire you. He was joking. He was joking. because I'll keep your name on the door. I don't want to lose you. But you should go back to what you know, back to where it all started for you. You have the opportunity to do that. And, and everybody is, you know. So I had to resign. I had to resign and, and leave my office. And it was sort of sad. Um, but, you know, I'm glad I did because you always want to go back home. You always want to go back home to what you love. And it's, it's great to, to be here back in the business. And I'm going around the world one more time. And all, all the guys I competed with, Frank Zane and Arnold and Ferrigno, they're, they're all 70 and 80 years old. I'm, st I'm only 63, so I'm still the kid. When I go to Gold's Gym in the morning, I'm still the little kid. It's amazing how that works. But, so I have, I'm, I'm young enough. I feel like I'm 20. I really feel like I'm 20, 25 maybe. I'm, you know, it's like, I think it's the German food. I and mean, then we the German beer. I, I don't know. I don't know where it is. But uh, the food's better here. And I think life's better. Everybody, we're just talking at lunch. Everybody in uh, Germany wants to go to California. And I'm gonna, I want to come to Germany, you know. So, but I believe in being uncomfortable. When you're uncomfortable is when you grow. When you're in the gym and it, it hurts and you don't feel strong, that's when you grow. So I, everything in life, I, it's about being uncomfortable. So I told my wife, I said, let's move to Europe. She's like, okay. <laughs> She's like, fine, no problem. And we live in three countries right now, three different countries in, you know, in Austria and Croatia. And we have a place in Budapest, but uh, you know, we haven't decided on the third country yet. But it, it's very, I'm very uncomfortable. I have to learn the language. Have, people don't want me to speak English. They want to hear that California accent, I guess. But uh, I enjoy spending more and more time in, in Europe. I'm, we're still, I'm still a citizen of the U.S., and I have to go back, of course, uh, every so many months. But uh, it's, it's great to be here. But I believe uh, in being un I learned in the gym, when you're uncomfortable is when you grow. If you're uncomfortable, you, you grow in the gym. So I apply that to everything I do. So that's one of the reasons uh, I've decided to spend a lot of time in Europe. Uh, plus, it's easier for me because there's so many countries close together. I can travel to many, many countries. But um, a lot of things happen during the course of my career that I want to share with you. And I, hopefully, I can propagate questions and ideas because I want, I want to make this about you, too. I want you to take me where you want to take me with questions, OK? Not outside, but with questions. Um, some of the things I learned about life is that if you want something bad enough, you can do it. I mean, I wasn't talented. I wasn't six foot five with a tiny waist. Uh, and I wasn't supposed to be a bodybuilder. I wasn't supposed to be a bodybuilder. I was really a strength athlete, a strong man. Uh, I was good at three and five reps. I could never do reps. It took me 10 years to learn how to do reps. And reps was the magic. 
that was the magic solution for me. It, a lot of things happened. But I learned things in the gym like, if you want something bad enough, if you really want something bad enough, there's nothing, you, you, you can get anything you want. And this has been repeated now throughout my life. So I went to California with 50 bucks and a plane ticket and no talent, but I had this attitude that I could do this. And everybody said, no, you can't, you're not genetically gifted. Uh, genetics is very important in bodybuilding. And I, was, I thought to myself as a kid, as a teenager, I will not be a victim to my genetics. They will be a victim to me. Okay, and I believe that. I believe reps, high rep squatting can remodel the body, can remodel the body. I believe this sincerely. In fact, that's what we're going to do after this. We're going to have a squat seminar and do that very thing. But one of the things I learned along the way is you can't let anybody tell you you can't do something, okay? Because everybody says, oh, you can't or you couldn't. And you got to be careful with your friends. The friends you have, you become your friends, okay? So sometimes I got rid of my friends and I made new friends. So I went, I go, I'm going to make new friends. I want to go to where the masters of the industry live and where they train. I'm going to go hang out with the very best bodybuilders in the world. I figured that, that, that's the kind of friends I have to have. When I hung out with these guys, everything was possible. And I remember, uh, you know, meeting Arnold Schwarzenegger and he said to me, this is America. And I said, yeah, I'm just a young kid. Yeah, I'm 10 years younger than him. And he goes, we can do anything we want to here and broken English, you know, I'm like, really? Okay, I believed him, I believed him. And it was it just, that environment was the, the one Gold's Gym, we had 15 guys and, no, 12 guys and three girls. One Gold's Gym, that was the fitness industry. But anything was possible. And bodybuilding was growing, it was becoming more popular, there was still no money. You know, we all, we all were like anointed zombies coming to California, like, you know, Night of the Living Dead, zombies. And, but there was really no choice. I think your career chooses you. Your career chooses you. But we came to California. I came to California, and it was the most, it was like heaven. I mean, that you could sense and feel the energy in the gym. It was just amazing that when I walked in Gold's gym, it was like, wow, this is heaven. This is heaven on earth. And every exercise I did, I, I, oh, Robbie Robinson was like a black panther walking from exercise to exercise. Zane, Frank Zane would do one set of sit-ups, one set of sit-ups, Roman chair sit-ups, for an hour. I'm like, wow, where are these guys from? I'm, not, I'm like a teenager, a muscle guy. Going, this is a different planet. I don't know where these guys are from. So I go, I have to do what Zane does. I have to do that. And I, you know, he would do, he was different. Robbie Robinson was different. Arnold was different. Everybody was very different. I go, how do I do that? So I figured I just, I'm going to just be around. I'm going to be around and watch and be the kid. And uh, we went to the beach every day because we had no suntan beds. We had no spray tan. You had to go to the beach. So we would go to the gym and go to the beach every day for three hours. Two hours in the gym, three hours. And that was my life for many years until I was able to turn professional. But I expected, I expected it to rub off. I, I felt like every weekend somebody's winning a contest and my turn's going to come. I don't care about genetics. Forget about genetics. I'm going to do my, I'm going to, I'm not going to be a victim to my, to my genetics. My genetics, genetics will be a victim to me. I really thought this. And I figured re tissue remodeling was possible. But the thing what I want to tell you is that I was, I was very, I didn't want to believe, I, I did not like living in reality. Reality was forget about reality. And nowadays when I work with Sir Julie Jr., it's all about running, it's like running for president. Well, so-and-so is in the contest, therefore I will not enter. I'm like, forget that. And when I was eligible for the Olympia, I went to the Olympia right away. But I really believe you can't let anybody tell you you can't do something. Because they will, they will. Can't let anybody tell you you can't do something, especially yourself. And once I adopted that mantra and I believed Everything started happening, and, and I was the kind of person that, you know, I, I went about life that way, and I thought to myself, if I give up on my dreams, if I give up on my dreams, what do you have left? I have to have the dream. I have to have a goal. I have to get up every morning and, and go after something. And I believe in that bodybuilding and fitness is, makes your life better. Abundance and prosperity is what I learned about in the gym. Nowadays, most modern day Mr. Olympia competitors, they talk about the pain and the punishment and the sacrifice. I'm like, I never did any of that. I just went to Gold's Gym and girlfriends and, you know, beach and Corvettes and palm trees and, and I started making money. I'm like, well, it was never like deprivation. But some of the greatest Mr. Olympias I've ever, I've ever seen on stage, physically, 
uh, they talk about the pain, the deprivation, and the punishment. And I'm like, I, I don't understand that. I, if I was a young bodybuilder today, I wouldn't want to go into bodybuilding. You know, I would want to be like, I would rather look at David. But I want to be like David. You know, perfect representative. He's he's had, he's a family. He has a good business. And and I, back, but to be sacrificed and do without, I don't understand that. And I never did. And that's sort of the way I approached it. I made my own rules. Of course, my teacher was Arnold. Make your own rules. Ignore everything. Just do what you want to do. And I believe I had to question science. If science said this, forget about science. In fact, my, in my humble opinion right now, I think we need less science. It's like at the Mr. Olympia, we have a bunch of science experiments on stage, you know? And I think we need more art. In my humble opinion, we need more art. The, the love of it. And that's missing. Phil Heath, as great as he is, is a little dead in the eyes. I don't see that love. You know, in the old days, we had to talk non-verbally to the audience. I would walk out on the Mr. Olympia stage, and our movements, you were actually communicating with the audience non-verbally. They don't do that anymore. And I think we need to readdress that. Everybody wants to go back to the golden era. Everybody wants to know what it was like in 1980, 1970. And I'd be glad to tell you about it. But everybody says, wasn't it great for you then? Wasn't it great for you then, Tom? How great it must have been to do what you do in the 1980s. And I said, yeah, it was great, but I really think that... That was training for what I do now. What I do now is far more important than what I did then. I mean, to be able to talk to somebody and help them get there. It's not about me anymore. It's not about me. But to work with somebody like David Hoffman and to see him, to help him get there, that to me is much more rewarding than doing it myself. In fact, that's what, that's what happens when you get to be an old guy like me. When you get in your 60s, you start thinking about, no longer about you, it's about helping, helping somebody else get there, okay? So it brings me great pleasure to, to work with David and to see him prosper and to see the attitude grow. And I, we, I just told David over lunch, we need a representative. We need bodybuilding needs somebody like that. Everybody else is walking around with food bags and water bags and they don't sleep and they live in their apartments all day long and they eat too much as far as I'm concerned. All they do is take drugs and, you know, and it's not about the love of it anymore. To me, it was about the love, and it was about the, the meaning of that, and it was my life's work. But in any event, uh, those are some of the things I wanted to mention. I'm going to have to get this coat off. Now I'm getting warm. Can I give you this coat? Okay. Thank you. And this thing? Yeah. A uh, water be good, yeah. Okay. Okay. I always dress like this only for the, uh, the, the videos. Thank you. Okay, now when, it, when I got dressed this morning, I'm like, oh yeah, we're doing another Matthias video again in later today, so thank you very much. I always uh, put these on for the David Hoffman video in the Matthias video, you know. Yeah. Uh, all the, I've been in Europe for about three weeks now, and I, always, I was wearing my skinny suits, my tight pants, you know, the, what's popular. This is my 90s outfit, you know, baggy pants. I feel much more comfortable. Okay, and the suspenders, I think suspenders are coming back, you know. Fashion repeats itself, okay, it does. But I would like to make this seminar about you. And I can talk all day long about, you know, the attitude and not letting anybody tell you you can't do something, especially to yourself like that. Uh, I can talk about not giving up on your dreams. And I was not ever the most talented. Okay, I wish I had one more life. I'd do something else that I'm not talented at. Okay, if I had one more life, if God said, okay, you're 63 now, uh, I'll give you another 30 years. Okay, wow, cool. You know, I, I would probably become a pro golfer or something. Something I, I can't, I'm terrible at golf. I'm terrible. But I, I, I wasn't good at bodybuilding. Bodybuilding wasn't the thing that was my, my, I was real, real good at it. But I just decided, and I think attitude will take you further than any genetics. If you want something bad enough, you can do it. And to me, everything is about attitude. And that's... I, I can go on and on and on about that, and I've been around some of the very best people, some of the biggest winners, some of the most richest people in the world, money-wise, and they, they said the same thing to me. I mean, Trump, look at, look at Trump, he's president of, of, of the United States. Everybody said, you will never be president. Everybody, all of my acting friends, look, watch my lips. Donald Trump will never be president. They said this to him, many times, and now he's president. I love that. I love the fact that the, the unlikely winner became the winner. And that really was like my life, too. I mean, I wasn't supposed to be the winner. I wasn't invited by Joe Weider to, you know, under contract and given a car and an apartment. Uh, 
I was the guy that wasn't supposed to be there. And for a lot of reasons, uh, I, I became the guy. But I think luck is when preparation, when you prepare, 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 when, when preparation meets opportunity, all of a sudden I have the opportunity to be the winner of the event. And I, I think really, and I was telling David this over lunch, I don't think that the title makes the man or the woman. The contest win doesn't make the man or the woman. It's the man or the woman that makes the title. So it's not by chance that David Hoffman won this weekend. You probably saw how many people were at the show when David won this weekend, okay? But he won because, thank you very much. He, the, he, they gave him the title because he already is the guy. He already is the bodybuilder. Thank you very much, Mr. Boku. I mean, Dr. Shum. <laughs> I forget what country I'm in, I gotta forget. Okay. But uh, and when you really look at it, talent is, an, is not that required. Talent is not required. Attitude, belief system, and the only difference between me and you is that I wanted, I wanted it more. And probably got up, I got up one more time. A winner just gets up one more time. I didn't even win. I didn't even win the Mr. Olympia. Ten times I lost to Mr. Olympia, and I'm still working. Okay, so it's not about winning. And I, told, I tell this to Sean Roden. I said, Sean, your job just starts today. Okay, when he won the Mr. Olympia, now you're just starting. Get ready. You know, you can't sit back and, you know, be the, the king. No, no, no. It just starts. But it's been, bodybuilding's been very good to me, as I mentioned. And I'd like to really give you insight into, you know, maybe my psyche or talk about old stories, uh, the old days. Uh, the old days are great. Uh, they were wonderful days. But I do love the new days, too. Um, and I wish I had more time, though. And I know it's, I'm not dying. I'm not going to get die. I don't think so, anyhow. But you know something? I, I do get on Instagram once in a while. Once in a while, I try not to. But some of the young 20-year-olds, they say things to me like, isn't it really sad, Tom, that you gained all that muscle in the 1980s only to lose it now? I'm like, whoa, I never, I never heard that before. And it startled me. I'm thinking, well, if, it, if I was climbing a mountain, if we were climbing mountains back in you know, the old days, and we got down on the mountain, you'd never forget climbing the mountain. The body, not, muscle's temporary. It's a temporary thing. So is life. I mean, so is life itself. It's temporary. You know, when you really think about it, and I think about these things when I'm in my alone time. I mean, I love being in front of people. I love traveling to Europe. I love being on every day and doing that. That's why I do this, okay? But I also like being alone. I'm one of those kind of people, that too. But, when, but I'm alone is when I really think about things and the answers come when you're alone. It's hard to be alone nowadays because, you know, you really got to, Shut off, you know, your, t your phones and, you know, the answering machine, all the things that are bells and whistles that are going off. But when you're alone, you know what to do. The answers come. I believe that very, very much. But um, it's all temporary. So the way I look at life, especially right now, is that someday it's going to be your last day. I know I don't mean to get dark and gruesome, but someday... It's going to be our last day. So I'm going to live every day as if it's my last day and do stuff that I always wanted to do because I don't want to go, oh man, I'm dying tomorrow. I'm dying now and I missed it. I don't want to think about what I could have, should have done. I want to do it now and I don't care about talent. I just care about doing it now because I want it. I want to do it and it's within me. And I believe that. And everybody I've talked to that's extremely successful, like Trump, I knew him before he was president. He always wore his ties too long. I started doing the same thing when I wear ties. You know, I just emulated him. But uh, Arnold was the same way. He, America, you can do anything you want to. Um, Vince McMahon, you know Vince McMahon, WWE? He, his business his, was on his kitchen table for a lot of years before he bought the company from his father and took it to television and became a billionaire. He's a, he took home a billion and a half dollars a year. When I was working with him, and I did for about four years, he took home a billion and a half dollars a year. And you know what? His secret dream, what he really wanted was to be on the bodybuilding stage. I'm like, wow, you make a billion and a half dollars a year and you want to do what we do. And we want to do what he, we want the money, we want the life. But you know, everybody wants what's on the other side. I mean, everybody I talk to in Germany wants to go to California. I want to come here. I want the small espresso cup, and I want the nice little restaurant that's 200 years old. I, I crave the small things, and you guys crave the big things. It's always green on the other side. It, it is. 
But I think everybody should travel. Everybody should travel. All my relatives, I said, you got to go to Europe. You have to go to Germany. You, you have to experience other cultures. And I think that really teaches you things and opens your eyes up to what your potential is. But there's nothing we can't do if you really want it bad enough. I really believe that. I don't care what it is. There's a guy in Hungary, and I'm mentoring a lot. I'm even mentoring bikini girls. This is really cool, okay? I never thought of bikini girl. Bikini girls would come to me and go, can you work with me? I'm like, you're coming to me? I retire, you know, there was no bikini, but I think I must have said something in a video about you know, the girls teaching me, and I did. The girls taught me how to pose. I didn't know how to pose. And remember, I was in the Gold's Gym years ago, and this one girl, she said to me, I like the thing you do with your hair. I go, what are you talking about? What do you mean I think I do my hair? Because I was trying to imitate Zane. I was trying to imitate Arnold. Uh, I, we all copy everybody when we first start. But you know, I like that thing you do with your hair when you do that. And you, know, you look up and I'm like, really? So I slowed it down and became known for that movement. You know? I copied you. Love. You copied it? You did that? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was in the UK many years ago, back in the 80s. And I had a sweatsuit on and I had lint on my skin. I had oil on my skin. And I had big purple, like dark blue purple pieces of material on my skin. And I was out posing on stage. So I, oh my God, I got to get rid of the lint, this stuff on my leg, before I hit the shot. And became sort of a, a technique. I dusted my leg. And every, every time I guest pose for the next, th yeah. So every time I guest pose around the world, I pretended there was lint on my skin and dust. People thought it was an it, it happens. Amazing what happened. You know, it, didn't ha it ha wasn't planned. It really wasn't planned. I didn't plan on having the best legs in the world. I mean, I don't, I don't know. You know, it's weird. I stopped squatting. Everybody told me not to squat. Oh, you shouldn't squat. Bad, bad, bad for your back. No, Tom, you shouldn't do that. Thank you very much for your, you know. So I had the confirmation from my parents, and they believed it and all that stuff. But in any event, that's where I come from. I, I come from the land of unreality. I don't believe in a reality. I believe that dreams do come true. I really sincerely believe that dreams do come true. And if you want something bad enough, and only you or you can't let anybody, especially yourself, get in the way of that. And, you know, that's been my life's mantra. And if there's one thing I have to say to you, uh, that would be some of these things I'm saying now. I mean, don't give up on your dreams. I don't care what it is. I mean, you know, Whatever the dream is. If it has to do with bodybuilding, great, wonderful. But if you can do this in the gym here, if you can squat like we're going to squat a little bit later today in this gym, you can do anything out there. But I hate squatting. I really don't like squatting that much, okay? People think he loves squatting. I'm addicted to the feeling afterwards. About a week after squat day, I'm like, wow, life is wonderful. I'm like, hi. I'm, I'm, I'm like stoned for a week from squats, okay? The grass is green. The sun's out. I don't, even if it isn't, I still see the sun, okay? And uh, it's, it's really that kind of, you know, week after squatting, I'm, I'm, like, I'm like abnormally high based upon from squatting. So I'm addicted to that feeling afterwards. But these are some of the things I'm thinking about right now. And I wanted to share some of the things I thought about with you. I thought uh, about uh, at, at dinner or lunch, whatever, breakfast or whatever it was. I lose track of time, time zones in different countries. I'm not sure what time it is. Um, but... Where do you want to take me? What would you like to talk about? If, if I, if, you know, is there something you would like to talk about that is on your mind, that you know, you're here for a reason? If there isn't, that's okay. But if there is, please, direct, let, let me, I'll be able to talk a long time about any question, but anybody have a question you'd like to me, for me to direct? I have to say something. Sure. Um, so, first of all, I would like to thank you to be here. Thank you, sir. And um, I'm not a bodybuilder, but I would call myself a bodybuilding fan. Wow. But I used to be a professional BMX rider for 12 to 13 years. Mm -hmm. So uh, how I got into bodybuilding was my friend David. Um, yeah, we hang out and I was in his gym. This and David? Yeah, this David. Okay. So I got into the sport and I got into the video, the first one from uh, San Diego. Uh -huh. So I got, that was the first time I ever saw you on, uh, on TV. So I got really sucked into that and I was glued to your lips for like th these two hours on this video. And when the second video came out, I was mm -hmm. like, wow, that's brilliant. I really like that. So I started to spread the video between my BMX friends. And they, it went viral in this different sport. It couldn't be more far away from bodybuilding yeah. than, than it does. But I just would like to thank you for that because it inspires me. And you know, the, all, this, all the things you say about these 
the last 5% is where the magic happens. Yeah. It's exactly what it is. And even in other sports, and it's basically what you just said, that it's just you can, you can do that wherever you want. Mm -hmm. And it helped me for my mindset. Thank you. For my BMX sport, which I'm doing, which I'm still doing, and yeah, thank you for that. Wow, BMX, I, I, I admire wow, BMX. Wow, farthest friend from what I could learn how to do. I mean, that's a, that's what I should do in my next life. BM, BMX guy. <laughs> I'm thinking about it now. How about ten more years, God? Please, give me ten more. <laughs> I don't know, but if you know, it's amazing. The attitude does work. It, it spreads too. For lack of a better word or analogy, it spreads like cancer, you know? And positive attitude, belief system, uh, it, it's amazing what it does to the human spirit. I mean, I've been all over the place as far as, you know, I remember being almost homeless one time in my life. Where I was all borderline homeless going, man, I'm I know all the homeless guys by name on the beach, okay? I'm like, Joe, I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm there. And I'm thinking, I gotta get out of here. I, I, gotta, I gotta get a job, okay? So I got a job fixing windshields. Okay, and I just decided within myself that I'm going to be the best windshield fixer ever. I'm going to I'm going to do this job faster than anybody and more aggressively than anybody. I'd wait at the gas station and have this I'd have this intention in my brain like I'm going to do this I'm going to do this windshield, sir. There's a windshield I need to fix. Okay, go ahead. You know, and it was like everybody said yes because of my intention. So it's not by chance I work with companies and corporations about intention and belief system in terms of their process or sales agencies or whatever they do. Uh, but thank you for saying that. Thank you for acknowledging uh, that. Uh, I'm honored to be known by BMX guys. Wow, how cool was that? It's so weird, but it... It is kind of weird, you know? But talking about weird stuff, I should tell you something else. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. Um, I was asked, I don't know, earlier in the week when I was in the UK, they said, who would you compare yourself to that's a modern day, you know, performer? I don't know, I, I haven't even shared this with anybody yet. Uh, this is going to blow you away probably. <laughs> uh, but I, I look at modern day performers. I look at myself as a performer. You're, you're an athlete, you have, to be, you have to sell the muscle on stage. If you can't sell it on stage, nobody's going to buy it. You've got to be the diplomat running for office, almost going from country to country, talking about what we love. And you've got to be the businessman building a brand like David has, okay? Sort of like brand sharing is what we're doing, if you will. And it's working great. I mean, I, I'm so happy for you. I just, wow, this is like, this is like Santa Monica here in Germany. It's amazing, you know, the, the shirts and the attitude, the mentality. But the, the performer that I thought about, I'll tell you about who that is in a second. But I always liked female vocalists like Whitney Houston. You know, she belts a song out uh, from the tip of her toes to the top of her head. You know, she's just full of it. I'm like, wow, that's what bodybuilding should be like. Somehow, that's what we got to do. That's what I got to do. I don't care about anybody else. That's what I got to do. If that makes sense. Does that make sense at all? About the performer? Okay. And then I thought about this on a plane, actually, uh, going to uh, from Crayford, uh, Crayford in the UK. I was there doing a seminar and I went to uh, Stoke-on-Trent. Stoke I was there doing a seminar. And, I, and if, if Lady Gaga, you know who she is, right? Okay, how could you not? But it, it, if Lady Gaga was a bodybuilder, <laughs> and if she was 35 years older, and if she was a guy, that would be me. Okay, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but you know, when, I, when you really look at Lady Gaga, you think she's attention seeking and looking for attention only, and you think it's all artificial, and, you know, but really, when you look at her, when you study her, when you get to know her, the love of what she does is clear, and it's, it's her art, okay? She's, she's, she's not afraid to do what she wants to do and express herself the way she wants to express herself. She won't let anybody tell her she can't do something. She used to audition for acting roles until told her she was no good, so she went into music anyhow. Now she's got an act, she did this acting job. You gotta see a star is born, you gotta see it. It was fantastic, but when I look at her, and one of her main goals in life is to be of service to others. She talks about her fans, younger fans, being little monsters. But she really wants to affect people and the young people that are in school, that are not that, you know, are feeling kind of like bullied. She wants to enable them or what does she say? Uh, liberate them. Uh, that's an interesting word. But, uh, and if I look at what I do, I mean, it's not about me anymore. It's not about me. 
My time's over in this business. And I want to be of service to others, help somebody else get there. And it's the art, the love of the game is really where I come from. It wasn't about, you know, necessarily the money. It, it was a nice side effect to the business, yeah. But if it's only about the money, it's sort of empty. And I once thought during my career, and it's been up and down as I'm sort of alluding to, but I thought whoever has the most stuff wins. I had a house on the East Coast by the water. I had a house on the West Coast by the water. I had the Porsches, the BMWs, you know, and I was like, I had all the stuff. And I gotta tell you, I'm not, I wasn't as, as happy as then as I am now, doing what is really meaningful to me, you know? And so I, I really, I gotta thank you for the reception today. I'm like, wow, people still remember me from the old days. It's, it's, it blows me away how young people like yourself remember the 80s or would like to remember the 80s. And I guess maybe it's a wonderful thing and I thank God for that. But I wanna make this about you. I wanna know where you are and how I can address certain things that maybe I have not already or maybe I wouldn't otherwise if I continue with my, my own you know, protocol as far as my speaking. Other questions of any kind? Yes, sir, yeah, please. Um, I have one question um, that translates to what Swatting. When you squat, yeah. um, I, it happens to me, but I think I'm not the only person. And when I squat, my legs don't give up, but my lower back does first. So I have like a weak lower back. I'd okay. like to know what you can do to strengthen the, to the, your lower back to get stronger in squat. Your lower back gives out before your quads do, yeah. which is a lot of people. In fact, yeah. you're going to be in the squat clinic after? <coughs> you should be, because it's a technique issue. It's a definitely a technique issue. I, I had a, um, the last, especially yesterday when I was, where was I yesterday? Cologne? No. No. Where was I? Yeah, Cologne. No, it wasn't Cologne yesterday. It was the other. How do you say it? Doolin, right? Doolin? Doolin. You know where Doolin is? Okay. <laughs> I forget every day sort of like goes into the next day. But uh, I had two girls in this seminar. They're really good girls. They're, you know and their lower back was the first thing it got tired and it was a technique issue. When we, when we discussed technique and really worked on the technique, I got them to the point to where their lower back was not the prime mover, their quads were. So I, I believe in a quad dominant squat. It's a technique orientation type thing. But if you're, most people, the lower back gets in there, the lower back gets tired before the quads and you almost have to do a lot of other exercises, okay? So there's a, it's a technique issue. I was taught by weightlifters. And I gotta tell you, I'm standing on the shoulders of many great men and women before me, okay? I'm, people think, well, I'm not, I'm not the message, okay? I'm the messenger. I mean, I was taught by the greatest athletes and businessmen in the world as far as how to get stuff done and get what you want, okay? I mean, Norbert Chermansky, gold medalist in the Olympic Games, was taught me when I was 12. And when I went into the gym at 12, they're like, what are you doing in here? You shouldn't even be in here. Get out of here, kid. I'll tell you what, we'll work with you if you get a pair of lifting shoes. Go ahead. Where are you going to buy a pair of lifting shoes in 1970, you know? <laughs> Can't go online yet. Okay, so I went to a sporting goods store, and the guy came out, and he happened to have a squat shoe in my size. And my mother gave me 100 bucks, and I, they cost almost $100. My mother still remembers this. And she almost killed me that day. But... I went back to the gym and said, okay, I'm ready. Teach me. I want, I want to learn, okay? Like I did when I went to the corporation. You've got to be enthusiastic. You've got to be hungry for information. You have to have a killer instinct about you to where I want to know. I want to know. I went to California. I want to know. I want to know. What, what, do, you got, what do you got to do to do this? We got to talk about technique, okay? It's a technique issue. Uh, you can adjust your body to make things happen. And you don't, you don't have to be a victim of your genetics or a victim of your technique. Technique is, is adjustable based upon structure and, and anatomy, most definitely. And that's what we're, exactly what we're going to be doing in seminar after this, okay? So if you can come and just even hang out and watch, ask David, though, because I, I don't know how he, but that'd be a good thing. I could answer that question. Watch the video. Yeah, you could do that, too. Okay. But uh, is it okay if I move around? Okay. Wenn jemand eine Frage hat und dem, sich im Englischen nicht traut, könnt er die auch gerne in Deutsch stellen, dann können wir die auch äh, übersetzen. Also, 
but art, <coughs> bodybuilding to me is art. We used, to, we used to call bodybuilding a sport, an art, and a science, right? Well, at least we, you don't remember this, but in 1980, 1975, uh, we called it a sport, an art, and a science. And I just think right now we have a bunch of science experiments on stage, and in my humble opinion, we need less science and more art. Okay, like David Hoffman. That's exactly what he's bringing to the table. And things, come, things change. I mean, fashion changes. Everything comes back. But I look at modern day bodybuilding and uh, I think, even though Phil Heath makes $400,000 every time he won the Olympia, that's pretty good. It's better than when we were competing. But the worst golfer in the world makes a half a million dollars a year. The terrible worst guy on the tour makes a half a million dollars a year. I think we could do better financially. And I don't think it's money. I don't think it's more than money. But I think, you know, we need people that represent what we do. We, when you go to basketball or football, they teach the young athletes how to give interviews, how to be, and how to function, if you will. And I, I, I think and how to dress, how to, how to talk to the press, how to give interviews. And we need that in bodybuilding, too. Um, hopefully, when you get to be my age and you have the ability to, to re-enter the sport as a coach or as a trainer, uh, I don't like the word trainer, coach is a better word, I think. But uh, I hope I can make, I, I'd like to leave it a little better than when I found it, you know? And I, I can get into the psyche of modern day athletes. Because I, I know, I, I'm looking for something with modern day athletes that I haven't seen a lot yet. I do see it here. And, I, and there's a guy, in, also a guy in Hungary, his name's Peter Molnar. And, uh, you know, he's very good. And like David, I said, you should be on the world stage. You should beat the Mr. Olympia. I don't care how popular you are in four or five countries, you know. And Peter is like sort of scared to leave Hungary and compete at the Olympia. Great bodybuilder. Wonderful bodybuilder. Great, more talent than I can ever dream of. But I asked Peter about his life when he was a boy. He said, Tom, I was always very shy. I was always very shy. I go, okay, I get it. Most of us bodybuilders were shy, and that's why we got into this, to gain an identity. And then the identity went into our art. You know, but being lifting weights as a 10-year-old became that guy. Don't bother, don't mess with him. You know, it was a good thing back then, too. But uh, Peter said to me, uh, when I was 10 years old, I went to a dance, and when I was 15 years old, I went to a dance, and I always wanted to ask that girl to dance, and he mentioned some girl, he, and, and he said, but I always waited to the next song. Then he said, how about the next song? He goes, the next song came on and then I never, I didn't ask her to dance, I was still too shy. And finally the third song came on and the dance was over, he never asked the girl to dance. So whenever I talk to him, whenever I text him, whenever I communicate with him, I, every day I said, Peter, get up in the morning and ask the girl to dance. In other words, it's not about asking the girl to dance, it's symbolism or it's an analogy for getting to the world stage. Take the risk, take the risk. There's a risk involved in any success venture. Mr. Olympia to him is out here. It's really, you've got to put it in here. Like David. David, the Mr. Olympia is in here. He just walks up and says, hey, I'm the guy. You know? And he doesn't say, judge me. He just become, he's the man, and the judges are compelled to vote for that, if that makes sense. So I have a lot of things I want to say about a lot of things, but a lot of it, as you know, is about attitude and belief system. But take me somewhere else. Where else do you want to go? Anywhere else? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. So I don't have a question, but I just want to say um, in a video in 1980, right before the Mr. Olympia contest, you said, um, I consider Arnold to be bodybuilding. Yeah. And you, for my own part, you, you did a paradigm shift. I'm sorry? You, you did a shift, you, you shifted it into yourself. I consider you to be far more cre uh, inspiration than Arnold. That's, that's, well, that's, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, Arnold's been very influential to me, uh, Dave Draper. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, we all went to California. I remember talking to Arnold. I, we're, I'm here because of you. I didn't come to California because of somebody else. I came here because of you. I remember one time uh, I was, you know, at the 1980 Mr. Olympia in Australia. Uh, Arnold wasn't the popular, most popular winner that year. I don't remember that. It's too long ago. But I went to his office afterwards and I said, Arnold, I'm not going to boycott. All the, all the competitors wanted to boycott Arnold in 1980. I said, I'm not, not going to boycott you. It doesn't feel right. I, I, I'm, I support you. I'm going to be at your show in Columbus in six weeks. His girlfriend at the time, Maria. Maria was a fluffy, kind of a fat girl. 
back then. And I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, what's Arnold dating a fat girl for? You know, I'm like, and Maria's beautiful, don't get me wrong, she's a beautiful woman. And she got leaner over the years. But Maria looked at me a few days later and she goes, Tom, Arnold really needed to hear that from you. He really appreciated it. He didn't say that to me. But he needed to hear some, one of us, one of the guys say, hey, I'm with you. I believe in you. And, you know, and Arnold doesn't care. He gets up. And keep, he fell down many times, all of us. The only, we just, you got to keep getting up. They teach that in the gym. And in the gym, achieve failure. In the gym, achieve failure. I mean, I have people that I used to compete with come to Gold Gym over the years and they would watch me fall on the floor with a lot of weight. And they said, you put the weight back on the bar, you get up and you did it again. I said, yeah. Like, What's the story? Like, I couldn't believe you did it. I'm like, why not? You got to get up. No matter what, you got to get up. But Arnold was very helpful early in my career. And uh, he, he assisted me. Okay, he did. I mean, nobody does it alone. And I shouldn't tell you this, but I think I will anyhow, I guess. Now everybody listens. <laughs> really good. We didn't have any computer imagery or computer ability, but he sent me a picture about a eight, ten months later of carrying me under his arm, walking across his front yard. In other words, he, he didn't say anything. There was no message, nothing written. But he sent me this picture of a, me superimposed underneath his arm saying, I'm the king. Don't ever forget that. I'm the boss. I'm helping you. Okay? I love Arnold. Don't get me wrong. He's a Terminator in real life. That, that character, the Terminator, is the way he operates in life. And uh, for me, I have two mentor figures. I had Arnold and I have Dave Draper. And Dave Draper was, you know, the blonde-haired guy before Arnold, uh, very famous. He was embarrassed to be Mr. America. He was actually embarrassed. And uh, Dave was the kind of guy that went to the woods in Santa Ana, Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz Mountains, and would do wood carvings. He was a hermit. Or Arnold was like, you know, the Terminator in real life. So I positioned myself somewhere in the middle as far as my career. But uh, Arnold's been very helpful. Even today, even today, uh, I go to Gold's Gym in the morning. And uh, Arnold's there. Ferrigno's there. Robbie Robinson's there. All, all of us old guys are there. And I'm like, like I said, Arnold, it's, I think it's more fun now than it was back then. He's like, well, yeah, I hurt more here and all that stuff. Yeah, I get that. But it's... Uh, Life is what you make it and what you see. Through my eyes, everything's wonderful. You know, California, Hollywood's really a dive. Hollywood's a dump. It's not big, you know, but from, from my eyes, you know, you, maybe from your eyes too, it's beautiful. I mean, everything about, you know, I can go to, I can go to a, a bad area and I see the good things. You can either look for the good or look for the negative. If you live with the negative, you, 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 the negative stuff happens to you. If you look for the bad, you believe in the bad. I believe in the good. I believe that the world is basically good, and I'm looking for that. And it's been like that for me. But Arnold, i got to tell you, he, thank you for saying that. Thank you for saying that, uh, you know, giving me the compliment. But, uh, and Arnold didn't even say that. He, he, wrote, he wrote an intro to my book one time in 1980, and he said that uh, I was able to, to continue, continue to where he left off. I mean, I was greatly honored by that, because I still hold him in, in high esteem. I mean, he did stuff that nobody else ever did before. Okay, but we, nobody does it alone. We don't, we don't do it alone. Bodybuilding is an individual sport, but it's certainly not, you don't do it by yourself. You know, the, everybody involved is very much so. But I think bodybuilders need to assume more responsibility. Nowadays, most pro bodybuilders go up to a coach and say, just do me, get me in shape for the Olympia. Nobody does it themselves anymore. We used to do our own diet, our own posing routine. You know, it was a, it was, and I felt proud to talk about it afterwards, you know. Nowadays, they, they ask the, the, the winner of the Olympia, and they're like, and the coach speaks. The coach talks. I'm like, the coach should never talk. The coach should stay in the background. The coach should not get credit. It's Mr. Olympia himself. I want to know what he did, what she did. Okay? In any event, thank you. Um, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, I would like to know if you, throughout your whole career, not just your bodybuilding career, uh, I mean, till now, did you ever have been at a point where you, yeah, you you just thought like, I can't do this anymore? Sure. Or, and if you had it, how did you overcome it? <laughs> I get scared to death every squat day still. Okay, every, every time I go to the squat, <gasps> I'm like, God, what, what, what do I do this? It's been 50 years, 50 years in front of the squat. I still get scared to death. Okay. But yeah, I had many times where I was like, I remember the 76 Mr. America, 76. You, you know, you weren't even in consideration probably in, in life yet, you know, right? What year were you? Okay. <laughs> Your mom and your dad didn't even meet yet. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <that's true. laughs> but I told my dad, I'm coming home. 76 Mr. Uh, Mr. America was in Philadelphia. 
Pennsylvania, and I'm coming home. My dad's driving. It's late at night, real late at night. And I said, Dad, I think I'm going to quit. I'm very despondent. And I'm like, this, maybe this isn't the thing for me. And uh, it lasted about 15 minutes, and then I'm, I'm strategizing for next year. <laughs> okay. But yeah, I mean, there are many times where I, I looked at myself and said, do I really have what it takes? And the answer was like, I got to get up. I, I got to keep, keep moving forward no matter what. I mean, and, and I do this with everything, but even in the eyes of failure, even like failure is looking at me, I'm like, I'm going this way. And I, I challenge failure every time I learned that on the squat rack. When, as I failed many times on the squat rack, you didn't, didn't read about it. Uh, sometimes I succeeded. You read about that, okay? Um, but the squat rack, I mean, I, like when I was doing 50 reps and with, with big weights, I, I really didn't, I couldn't count that high. I couldn't manage that many reps. My trading partner were very, were very supportive. And I really think it was, I mean, the last, when I was doing 50 reps of 405, the last 10 reps, I didn't do them. It was God, you know, well, it wasn't me, okay? But I, I, was, I was raised, I was raised with Star Trek to boldly go where no man has gone, and Arnold Schwarzenegger too. So that was my, my, imp, my what I felt about, it, what I looked at, what I thought about when I was training. But many times I thought, I would always question myself, do I really have what it takes? And my answer to talent was always no, but I, I didn't want to live in that reality. Like I said, I just refused to live in that reality. I believe that there, I could do it because everything else worked out that way. And I was really a strength athlete. I'm gifted to be a strength athlete. I was good at three and four or five reps. To learn how to do reps was a 10-year process, at least, uh, to do high reps. But I figured the magic was in the reps. I just, I instinctually, I figured that. I, didn't, I wasn't the scientist back then. I didn't realize that reps are good for mitochondria enhancement, sarcoplasm attainment, capillary development, and training another specific fiber type. I just knew reps was the answer. Because I was training with guys that were squatting 1,000 pounds. And I'm squatting, you know, 500, 600 pounds, mere, you know, that, and my legs are much better than theirs were. I'm like, how come they have tiny legs and they're squatting 1,000 pounds? So I knew that being strong wasn't the whole answer. You had a technique was a consideration, of course. Where's my technique guy? Yeah, okay. I, you know, there's a strength guy, a strength athlete moves weight sideways. They can move more weight sideways with less gravity. So they're very smart. So I figured I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be a bodybuilder. I'm going to make everything hard as possible. I'm going to use gravity against me, which is one of your clues to your question. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I was always wondering if I should keep going. And the answer was always, I have to. I have to. As I promised myself, I'm going to tell you something else I haven't told anybody in a long time. Um, when I was a little boy, I was playing football, and my coach kicked me in the butt. And I went, I was like 120 pounds, okay, was it, 60 kilos? And I'm, I'm like on the ground outside on the field, and he goes, Platts, you're nothing. You'll never be nothing. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm a 12-year-old kid going, Wow. His name was Coach Smith. Coach Smith. 35 years later, the football team contacted me and they said, are you the same Tom Platts that Coach Smith talks about? I said, yes, I am. Please tell Coach Smith thank you for everything he's done for me. Okay? So I needed a kick in the butt. So when I talk a little bit bad about Sean Roden, I want him to go, Platts, um, you're wrong about me. I want that. I'm that Coach Smith rubbed off on me too. I want when I talk bad about Sergio Jr., because Sergio Jr., he was squatting, I was training him for the Arnold Classic, he does 15 reps, and he stops. I'm like, what are you stopping for? He goes, no, I, I only do 15 reps. I'm like, are you kidding me? You, you know, you look like this, and you, that's the way you train? That's your mentality? Oh my God, you know? Your dad would kill me. In 84 at the Olympia, his dad had Sergio Jr. in his hand, like a trophy on, on, on his, in his hands, you know? And I, I was there, I was right next to Sergio, we were kidding around. So I'm thinking, Jeez, you know, if I'm going I'm I'm to do the Creed movie with, with his son, we've got to do more than 15 reps. But Sergio backed off. Now, and then, of course, once he got in better and better condition, he would contact me and go, Tom, I'm ready now. I'm ready now. I go, well, I can't make it back to L.A. right now. But I would text him before the Olympia. I said, you know, whatever you believe and whatever energy you have when you walk on stage at the Olympia, the, your audience and your fans are going to believe. Don't just give in to being being eligible to compete at the Olympia. You know, David, you can't just be, oh, I'm eligible to compete. I'm going to give up now because I know. No. I think Sergio gave in to the, to the negative. 
he gave in to going, well, I'm not really that good yet. I'll just go make a debut, get my toe wet, you know. I would have walked up there if I was Sergio Jr., just better and meaner than showing him how it goes according to me. That's what you can do on stage. On stage, it wasn't about pleasing the judges. For me, it was never about pleasing the judges. I started that way. I started to get confused and wonder if I was good enough and question myself, right, exactly. But I thought to myself after that, I'm not gonna please the judges anymore. I'm just gonna express myself in the gym and really use my personality. My personality will be, will be an extension of my, myself in the gym. And I'm gonna humbly show the judges in the audience how it goes to me according to, I'm gonna show them how it goes according to me. So when I was on stage at all the Olympias, I didn't care about the judges. I never even looked at them. And I'm, I didn't, they were my friends. I guess posed in every country at least 10 times, you know. But the judges, I wasn't about to please. I wanted to just humbly show the audience how it went, how, how it goes according to me. Does that make sense? When I work with an actor, I work with a lot of actors in, in Hollywood, and I, I tell them, get the script, read your lines, make a decision on the character, then go to the audition and just show them how it goes according to you. And if the director, if the director says, hey, I like what you do, I never thought about it that way. Try it my way once though. I like your way better. In other words, you gotta be so sure about something that you wanna just, you, you'll project yourself versus somebody else's idea. And if I have to walk around, and, and this is what finally got me off the trying to please people and trying to do what the judges wanted me to do, I did what I wanted to do. It was an expression from within. And so I was just going on stage, it was a celebration of the gym all year long. And I just wanted to humbly, humbly, not cocky, not arrogant, but I was confident. And that, gave, that decision right there gave me so much confidence. I'm like, oh, it's my decision. I don't have to please anybody. I'm just going to do it the way I want to. And I got tired of listening to the judges. Yeah. He said, you're not good enough. He told me I wasn't good enough. Thank you, John. Thank you for your input. This is wrong with you, Tom. That's wrong with you. Okay. And then uh, who else? Uh, Reg Park. Uh, he wasn't good enough either. And I wrote a letter. As a nine-year-old, I wrote a letter to Joe Weider. And one of, G one of Joe Weider's writers, his staff, wrote back to me and said, Tom, we think you have potential. Okay, one person said I have potential. That's all I need, right there. Okay, his name was Gene Mose. He wrote back. I still have the letter at home, too, from the office, from the desk of Joe Weider. I'm a nine-year-old. You have potential to do this, Tom. I'm like, okay, you know. And from then on, it was like I, I don't care. If I walk around going, my legs need to be smaller. Okay, my, my, my back needs to be wider. My biceps need to be higher. I'm just trying to please people, and I just can't try to please. I, it's, I have to feel so confident about what I do, it has to be my own expression. So that was bodybuilding for me. That's how I survived you know, the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s, I guess, and even life, even life itself. I, I make a decision you know, on, on what I want to do for me, and I'm, I'm, I'm not afraid to do that, okay? But, but being scared of the squat rack and having fear and having doubts, you betcha, that's been my life, and this is how I dealt with it, okay? And I'm not saying I'm the greatest, the baddest, but it worked for me. And uh, it still works for me. And I'm still doing stuff that I'm not good at, you know? And that's what gives me energy. I like that. I like doing stuff I'm not good at. I'm not, I'm not good at nothing. So I don't have nothing I can do that I'm good at, you know? I'm just good at an attitude. I'm gonna make it happen. I'm gonna figure it out. If you want something bad enough, you can figure it out, okay? Other points, other questions. Yeah, way in the back. Go ahead, talk louder, okay, please? Okay, um, how did you get the, the mindset to achieve your goals in, in sports, but also in, in your uh, personal life and your business life? And actually, two, two small uh, questions that have to get together, I guess. Um, how do you motivate yourself every day? And how do you deal with uh, things that come in, in your way, obstacles or something you have to do that? Uh, yeah. Wow, you got me thinking now. Wow, this is a serious question. Okay. Uh, I may need your help again, but I forget that many questions at one. But uh, every morning, it's a choice. Every morning I get up and I go, how do I want to be today? I'm still, I'm opening my eyes going, okay. And I get, I'll take it up early. I like the early time. Like this morning. Well, I'm tired. I need to jump up somehow. I need, to, I need the goal. The goal is always important to me. Um, repeat your question a little bit to me, though. I'm going to need your question again. So uh, how did you get the mindset to achieve your goals? 
process. Um, and how do you motivate yourself every every time, every day? And how do you deal with your uh, with the obstacles that come your way? Well, the first thing I think about is that every day opportunities come to you, feelings and ideas come to you. You can either remain afraid of them or take them. Take them. I mean, I believe opportunities will come to everybody. I don't. I don't think life happens to you. Okay, I do not think that life happens to you. I think it happens for you. Life happens for you. So every day, ideas or feelings come to you. You can either take it or remain afraid of it, and it will go knock on somebody else's door. You know, I believe that. I believe that's the way life works. Life is supposed to be abundant. Life is supposed to be about getting what you want. And life in a career is supposed to be of service to others. The fact that, you know, a career and what you do is meaningful to others, that's a very important thing. I mean, the fact you're asking me these questions is very important to me. But every morning I make a choice. And still, I mean, I still have moments where I go, I doubt certain things, you know. And then I go, okay, wait a minute. I'm looking at it the wrong way. So, but every day opportunities come to you. And uh, it's a, really a conscious choice you make on which way you want to go and how, how do you want to live that day. And pretty soon it's, it's days and weeks and months and years and careers. Okay, I mean, it's very cathartic for me to talk to you all right now because this is my life's work. I mean, wow, it's my life's work. I mean, I'm not dead yet and there's some things I want to do, but I've had a long career, an awful long career, to where people come to the seminar and they were in the seminar 35, 37 years ago and they bring their sons and daughters to the seminar. I'm like, wow. What an honor to be of service to generations, okay? And it's not just me. I'm not all that. Uh, you know, I'm, again, I'm, I'm the messenger, not the message. And I've had some great teachers that I'm standing on their shoulders. Uh, and they've, they've taught me things. And a lot of times they didn't say things to me that I wanted to hear. And it shocked me and it, it scared me. I'm like, maybe I am nothing. What do you think, Coach Smith, you know? I remember him. I could see him right now in my mind so clearly. He smoked cigarettes on the football field. You know, <laughs> and he had this blue cap on. You know, God, I, I was scared to death of this guy. You know, I really was. Well, I was a little kid, you know. And he talked, when he yelled, boy, you, when you hear me yell at this David at the squat rack, that's, I'm thinking about Coach Smith. You know, he was there to motivate and, or destroy me, any of us, and he knew what he was doing. I didn't know it at the time. I thought he was just nuts and crazy and abusive and a bad guy, but I needed to hear that. So, but in any event, staying with your questions, um, repeat them again to me. I want to make sure I answer the question. <laughs> repeat them again. I get the, the, the first question to answer. Um, how do you deal with um, obstacles coming in your, in your way? Okay. I mean, as soon as you think it's clear and you know, you're, 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 everything's okay, problems Depression, doubt, self-doubt is really a gift. Depression's a gift. I mean, I've been down and out. I've been wondering what I'm going to do. After I retire from bodybuilding, I'm like, what do I do now? What do I do? And I remember like thinking to myself, why don't I get divorced? And that might be an answer. <laughs> Seriously. And so I went to my wife, the, the, the long, lean, tall Italian girl, and I'm living, in, I'm living in Santa Monica next to Lou Ferrigno in the big house, you know. I'm like, I think we should get divorced. He's like, what? I just, I, 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 I used to fantasize about having a small apartment and starting over. I just wanted to get rid of a lot of the, the, the glitz. And I wanted to, is in Santa Monica, you're considered a good person if you have, if, depend, based on what side of the, where you live in Santa Monica. If you live north of Montana, you're a good person. If you drive a BMW or a Mercedes, you're a good person. If you drive a Lamborghini, you're a better person. Okay, so I'm like, I, I gotta get out of this neighborhood. It's, it's pretty weird, you know? And uh, so I usually make a choice. I make a decision. And uh, you know, my marriage wasn't working out okay. It wasn't all about just getting divorced. But I do things that I think I should do. And I, I'm willing to take the risk. I mean, Half of my net worth went to her. Okay, yeah, it was a big risk, you know. It was only money. I can make it back again, you know. And money comes and goes. Money comes and goes. But the way you affect other people lasts forever. You know what I'm saying? And, I, and I've learned that, that my position in life was 
this guy who did stuff that sort of made people think. Uh, and it started with bodybuilding, led into public speaking and all that. And just what you're saying right now. I mean, the way I affect other people and the way people affect me. You know, money can't buy that. So money comes and goes. Money is not the most important thing in life. It's, it's a crucial thing. I like stuff. I like BMWs and Mercedes and nice clothes. Yeah, I do like stuff. Whenever I got, when it was all about the stuff only, something was missing for me. Why do you think I came back to bodybuilding? Why do you think I got remarried? To, I think true love exists, and I think that good things in life, you have to look for the good and embrace the good. And when I was working with Vince McMahon, he, he always told me to embrace the heat. If something's wrong, embrace it. Don't run from it. Don't, you know, even people in the gym, when you're squatting in the gym, don't run from it. Go out, embrace the heat. Go towards the pain. Go towards the problem. And then I learned that the solution is always in the problem. The solution is always in the problem. And furthermore, I really believe that solutions uh, or that problems and bad things and startling things are really gifts. Every injury I had, I learned how to train better. Injuries were really an opportunity in disguise. Bad things, uh, okay, um, 1981, four months to go for the Mr. Olympia, okay? And my fiance, the girl I was gonna marry, left me for my training partner. I'm like, and I was shocked, I was startled. I'm like, oh my God, four months to go, I can't train, I'm, I'm messed up, I'm hurt. And somehow I go, I go, I gotta get through this. I wanted to go over and just kill the guy. I thought I was gonna put a dumbbell through his head, you know, but I'm like, is that really the answer? No, I don't think that's gonna work. I probably won't be able to enter the Olympia, then I'll probably be in jail, okay. And for some reason that year, all the hurt went into my training. I just opened the door up to Gold's Gym, my arms would grow. Every exercise I did worked greater than ever. The hurt, the pain, the, 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 the terrible trauma, life drama and trauma, turned out to be the best thing in the world for me in 81. If I look back, the arm tearing in 1982, uh, the bicep tearing, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Anything negative that happened to me turned out to be an opportunity in disguise. And I look at life that way. It's hard to understand it at that time, but I always find, I always find years later, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Okay, so that's the way I sort of handle things. That's the way I look at things, and that gets me through. Nobody is, has an easy life. Life will drive you down to the ground, like squatting. Life will, life will take you down to the ground. It will tear you apart. When you think it's all good, life shows you you're wrong, you know? It does. Somebody dies, something happens to you, you lose money, you get physically injured, your family member dies, you're, you know, whatever, you get divorced. But you know something? We're supposed to feel that. We're supposed to go through those things to have the opposite. You gotta have, you gotta have Sadness to have happiness. You gotta have terrible workouts to have good workouts. Uh, you gotta have the opposites. And when I walk into the gym to squat, I walk in like I'm smoking marijuana. You know, people, I don't smoke marijuana before I squat, no. But it looks like, man, he's so relaxed, he's so mellow. Because if I'm gonna get way up here, I gotta start down here. I gotta have a place to go. And that's why I look at life has to have the opposites. And I accept it. And it's always worked to my benefit, because I expected it too. Even in the eyes of failure, even when somebody, even when my peers or my teachers said I could not, you shouldn't, I, I dis disagreed. Sometimes you're a teacher, sometimes you're a student forever, furthermore. I, I believe that, that's my mantra. You know, sometimes you're a teacher, sometimes you're a student forever. I'm still learning. When I work with a bikini girl, I'm learning. I'm like, wow. I, I work with some beautiful people. Beautiful girls, drop dead gorgeous, okay? And I'm like, why are they coming to me to ask me questions about how to, how to go on stage? I guess they see something in the videos or something. And I talk to some of these girls and I go, I realize after some weeks, they, are, they don't believe in themselves. They're lacking confidence so much. I'm thinking, how could a girl this beautiful not know she's that beautiful? Maybe it's an act, maybe she's just teasing me, you know, she's really, but she doesn't, all these girls don't know. And so I'm, I'm trying to get them to take that authenticity and that realness to the stage. That's what sells. It's not fake, artificial, that's what Lady Gaga sells, because she's real too. When I see a, fi a figure, a bikini girl or a figure girl go on stage, it's authentic, that holds yourself like a professional. 
that knows how to pose and communicate with an audience. It's, it's a wonderful, beautiful thing. In the same way a bikini girl prepares, it's the same way that the open class in the men's Olympia prepares. In fact, they need, I think the men's open class can learn from the bikini girls, to tell you the truth, and vice versa. Okay, and they do. And I have them all, I have in seminars I've done all there in a week, I had bikini girls and top world class bodybuilders in the men's open class. In the same seminar, using the same technique. Okay? <laughs> I hope that answers your question. It's just, you know, thank you for address, bringing those questions up and thank you for being here very much. I saw some other hands. Yes, please. I have a question regarding regeneration. Regeneration? Yes. Um, for example, when I train, like, I'm, especially when you do high intensity and high volume. Yeah, yeah. A lot of reps, and you really empty the muscle out. Um, following the training, like, for example, I train in the morning and in the evening, um, I'm always having troubles with uh, cramping up. And also, um, I'm sore, like, for the rest of the week. It's worse with the legs, of course, it's a bigger muscle. But also, um, I just feel like I need sometimes a week or longer to regenerate from a hard workout. Huh? And it hinders me from uh, training as often as I do. So, is there anything uh, you pay special attention to to just increase your ability to regenerate faster? You mean recovery? Yes. Is that the word? Okay. Yeah. I want to make sure it's not... I thought maybe you were alluding towards hyperplasia. Myofibril cell division. Okay, first of all, I believe that hyperplasia is possible. Okay. People theorize you know, hyperplasia, building more fibers. Yeah. People say you can't really, some people say you can build more fibers, some say you can't. Some people choose pharmacology. In the old days, we didn't have pharmacology. We went to reps. We went to high reps, crazy high reps with heavy weights. Under those circumstances, I believe strongly that hyperplasia is possible. Strongly, based upon my education in, my, in the field, in the gym work, okay? Recovery. I always believe in training hard, real stupid, brutal hard, and resting extremely hard as well. You gotta train hard, you gotta rest hard. People didn't understand that. They never talked about that in the magazines in the 80s. All they talked about was training hard. People thought I did that every day. I would squat twice a month. Twice a month, at my very best, at my very strongest, that's all I squatted. Okay, that was, that was my nervous system. Imagine doing 50 reps, you know, with 405 pounds. I mean, it's, it's, your nervous system is fried. I'd leave the gym going, <coughs> maybe in 10 days I might start thinking about squatting again, you know. And same thing with Sergio Jr. He was used to squatting every three to five days, you know. When we were squatting together and I was working with him, he's like seven, eight, ten days going, Tom, I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready to go back and do it again because intensity. It's a key, but mostly for mesomorphic athletes. You'll, all you do is vary the volume and the frequency, the intensity, and the workload, those four things. But intensity for me was like, wow, that's what works. I don't mean just training to failure when you think failure is accomplished. I mean when God says failure is accomplished, and you fight them all the way. Okay? And I learned this in the, in the UK last, last week. People, some people b believe that training to failure is when they want to stop. It's not when you want to stop, okay? So basically my message here is that I trained hard, but I rested very hard too. Recovery was essential. And I didn't care what everybody else said. Everybody else said, well, after 72 hours, you're going to lose muscle. <clears throat> right, sure, fine, whatever. I don't care what science says. It's just what I say. I'm not ready to go back to the squat rack yet. Um, but intensity, frequency, uh, workload, and volume, those are the four things you can adjust. I've thrived on high intensity. Volume was sort of creeping up, but I had to bring it down. Uh, I couldn't have that much volume with that much intensity. Frequency, forget it, way down, way down. Frequency, how often I trained was very low. Uh, workload, real high. Okay, so I, I, I was sort of halfway like Menser, halfway like Arnold. Furthermore, I should tell you the story. When I first went to California, I thought whatever Arnold does, I'm going to do. Okay. That's, my, that's, what I have to, that's why I went to study with the masters. So Arnold had a blonde girlfriend. I got a blonde girlfriend. Arnold drank coffee. I started drinking coffee. If he had uh, hash browns for breakfast and potatoes, I had potatoes for breakfast, whatever. So I train with him six days a week, twice a day. I go, here's what the best in the world does, the very best in the world. I have the opportunity to train the, the, the best in the world. I got small and weak. I got small and fat training twice a day, six days a week. I'm like... I'm depressed. I'm like, 
I'm in California, 50 bucks on a plane ticket, living with 25 people across the street from the gym. I'm in heaven and I can't put it together. Like, what do I do now? I did what Arnold did and I got small and fat. So I like wandered off, you know. I took three weeks off and I'm, just, I'm new to Gold's Gym. Joe Gold's bugging me to pay membership and I don't have any money, okay? Joe Gold's like, you gotta pay for membership pretty soon, Tom. I'm like, I don't have any money yet, Joe. Can, I, have, can you wait till after the Mr. Universe? He goes, okay, okay. Thank God. I was able to sell myself and my intention. I gotta, I gotta be here, Joe. I have to be here. Okay, Platts. Okay, you're okay. You gotta pay me back eventually, though. But I realized after taking three weeks off and being depressed because I could not keep up with Arnold, I go, I gotta figure something out. I gotta, I gotta figure out. This is a problem. It must, the solution must be here somewhere. I just don't know what it is. I don't know what to do. Maybe I should quit? Nah, I can't quit. I can't go back home. I go back home, be a champion that never made it. Okay? So, I went back to the gym after three weeks off and all of a sudden I'm, I'm bigger and I'm stronger. I'm picking the big dumbbells, 180 pound dumbbells back in my, the 90 pound, 90 kilogram, kilogram dumbbells. I'm like, I realized I can't train six days a week, twice a day. I can train three and four days a week. That's the secret for me. Mesomorphic people can train, can't train as often as they can't have the frequency. I can't handle the frequency. Arnold could. A lean, tall, person can do more frequency, okay, to put it in simple terms. So I realized that. So to answer your question, I, I assessed some of the variables through my depression, and the depression, the anxiety, the confusion gave me the answers, okay? I hope I answered your question, okay? But the answers always come, and I'm always looking for the answers, you know, and my wife always says, if God made it, I have no idea. If man made it, I can figure it out. This is what my wife says, and she does. She, it's, she's like, she's like five foot, or four foot ten, and she's French Polynesian. And tell you, I got to tell you, I'm lucky now. I found the best wife there is. I mean, I'm a much better man because of her in my life. I mean, she's, she's that kind of person, the spirit. She doesn't care about the money and the glamour of life, you know. And things are better for us than ever, and we don't even think about the money, you know. It's just, it's amazing how things come around. But I, I never want to focus on the money. I don't care about the money. I don't focus on the money. It's like, it's a side effect to doing what you love and what the, where the meaning is. But keeping my, my track, keeping on to your question there, that's the way I look at frequency, intensity, workload, volume, and recovery. You got to recover. And everybody's going to tell you how many, their version of recovery. The more intense you train, the more recovery you have to have. And that's been my friend. My, my own, that voice was inside me that said, don't do it everybody else's way, was, I followed that voice most of the time. And Arnold taught me that again. Arnold said, make, make your own rules up. Just, you know, he break the rules. Arnold, in 1980 Olympia in Australia, they said side tricep, and Arnold's like, you know, doing that, doing that, that mantis pose. In other words, guys don't cheat, get, guys don't do that anymore, but this is what we used to do. We used to break the rules and do it our way. And uh, it, was, it worked out. It worked out, listening to that voice within. But you have to be quiet to get that. You have to be real quiet and go through depression to get there. If you don't go through depression and not understanding, you'll never get there. That's part of the process. Yes? Um, regarding intensity, so you talk about um, intensity was your key and like, like squatting twice a month. Yeah. With, with very high intensity and crushing. Yeah. Um, so what was your uh, key for the other parts, like your chest, back, and stuff? You said, you tried to train like Arnold twice a day, yeah. six, uh, six days a week, there was nothing for you. Yeah. Did you handle like the other body parts uh, according to legs or how did you do that? I trained everything like my legs. Okay, I trained everything high reps. I remember doing T-bar rows for 100 reps. 100 rep T-bar rows. I couldn't do it right away. I had to work up to it. Uh, we squatted for body weight for 10 minutes one time. I'll never do that again. It was too much. It was too intense. Um, but everything I did, and I, and I became known for legs. I mean, we were doing some pretty crazy stuff upper body-wise. Uh, we were doing, you know, 180 pound or 90 kilogram dumbbells, you know, 10, 12 reps in the incline dumbbell press. I mean, uh, the weight was important for me for chest or legs, high volume, high intensity, not necessarily, I'm sorry, high workload, high intensity. For arms, it was never about high workload, uh, you know. I think a 35 pound, 40 pound dumbbell it was all it took. Finesse. And I watched Arnold all those years when I was early in Santa Monica, and I'm thinking, I never saw him go over a 40-pound dumbbell. Some of the greatest arms I've ever seen. 
And I would come into the gym early in the morning when nobody was watching. You know, I'm like, a, I'm like a young pro now. I can't go in the gym and handle 15 pound dumbbells. People are gonna take pictures of this and you know, they had, you know, I can't, I'm embarrassed. So I'd go in the gym with a 15 pound dumbbell and teach myself how to do reps and the importance of supination and pronation. So I realized for arms, it wasn't about the weight, how much volume or how much uh, workload. It was about the intensity. I would do one 10 minute sets, things like that. Things I was able to conjure up that worked for me. Uh, but every body part, I gave it that much attention. My, it wasn't just my legs uh, or just the squats or just the hack squats. Uh, you know, I, I, I couldn't do one hour sets like Zane did. I did about 25 or 30 reps and I, I, was, I was done. Okay, so, but I, I did other things. But I remember everything that I did uh, had the same approach, the same concept to where I'd uh, go into the gym and look for the feeling. I'd go after the feeling, not just the, the spreadsheet. Everybody comes to me now. I get girls and guys that come to me when I'm hiding out after my seminar tour. They're like, can we work together? I'm like, I don't know, maybe. Uh, what, 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 are you, what are you thinking? And they have a spreadsheet. They come in with a spreadsheet and a plan, a map. I'm like, first of all, get that spreadsheet, throw it away. Now we'll go to the gym. We, you know, the idea, initially, an artist paints by the numbers. In kindergarten, a small child paints by the numbers. An accomplished artist expresses themselves from within. So when, I, when you go to the gym, you know it's too heavy or too light, but you learn what to do based upon your experience. And it's a, creativity is the highest level of existence. Just following the rules and being a soldier of life, I can't live that way. I have to get into creativity and do things that, are, that I think about what might work in the gym. And now science supports me. Now the, the, some of the scientific dogma that's recorded in history as far as what produces hyperplasia is I can't say I'm responsible for that idea, but it was taken from research scientists watching us and, do and documenting what we do, okay? So that's, I hope I answered your question. I'm not, I'm not sure if I did or not, but that's where I would go with that. Uh, how are we doing on time? Uh, we okay? 20 minutes? Yeah, we can do that. Okay, okay sure. Okay. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, what was your biggest fault in bodybuilding? Biggest? Fault. Fault? Yes. <laughs> what was my biggest fault? Uh, chest came kind of easy, legs came, I don't mean easy, I'm not, I didn't come out of the room with cross striations, you know. But chest, <laughs> I got chest down early on. I got uh, legs down early on. Uh, back and arms were like, wow, how do you do that? How do I do it? And I just, I was, I was a big, I, could, I was a tugger. I was an old, I was a strength athlete. I wanted to move big, big weights. And so then I, I, I would watch Robbie Robinson. To this day, to this day, when Robbie Robinson's doing seated cable rows in the gym, I stop and I watch. It's just so perfect. And the way he does seated cable rows, the way he does T-bar rows, the way he does back training, there's an art and there's a style and there's a love. And I, I give my attention to that. And I try to emulate that. Uh, slowing the, using less weight and finesse, working, using my fingers and cocking my wrists like Robbie does. He doesn't know he does this, but I've watched him for years, okay? And those are the things that really work for me. Uh, so I have to say arms and uh, back was probably my weakest areas that I had to really had to learn about, I had to give special attention to and train differently. I, theor I really believe there's more red fiber here for me and this is white fiber, white fiber, this is red fiber, and this is red fiber. I had to learn how to train like a ectomorph here and here, okay? If that makes sense to you. Um, but I, always, I went to California to, for a reason, to study with the masters. And so I, to this day, I mean, to this, three weeks ago, I was in the Gold's Gym going, look at that. Look at Robbie Robinson do that. You know, he's 73 or four years old right now, but he still has that finesse. And I watch that and I think about that. So if I, if I think about body parts that didn't come naturally for me, I, I would think of along those lines, okay? But your weaknesses can become your strengths sometimes. They can. I believe that. Other, yes, way in the back. Do you think uh, progression is important or to go every uh, training to failure with the way to success? Training to failure, uh, I believe, if he really, in fact, I talked to my training partners my training partner, Tony, will, he'll, he'll t relive the story with me sometimes. And he goes, people have no idea what we used to do. The stuff we used to do, every workout was extreme failure, 
go on to the point of where your life passes in front of your eyes, and that's what worked for me. Uh, sometimes you, not, not everybody could sustain that, and I certainly couldn't, but I had to blend that with easier workouts in between. But for my, I really didn't put easy workouts in. I would just rest more, if that makes sense. Um, but what's, what would be considered abusive, uh, like if Lee Haney were to look at what he did, we, look, we trained together, I could, I, he trained so politely, I'm like, that's too polite for me to train that way. I believe if you train nice, you look nice, you know? I wanted to look, you know, like freaky, you know? I wanted to look, do stuff nobody's done. I remember Dorian Yates used to be in the seminars in the back of the room, and I, I would say stuff like, I want the judges to drop their pencils when I walk out. Dorian picked up on that, and he certainly did that. But everybody copied Dorian ever since. Dorian, uh, people copied him ever since. And I'm waiting for the next guy not to copy Dorian, if you will. We, we all copy. We all copy. But the training methodology is there. We do have the technology to do, to remodel tissue. And nobody talks about that anymore. All they talk about is, uh, you know, GH and insulin and peptides and all that stuff. Which is interesting, it's thought provoking, but I'm like, I think drugs of any kind mask the human spirit. I think the human spirit is put down. And that's why I think we're not seeing the magic on stage we want to see. I think it's mask, masked, if I may say so, uh, with, the, with the drugs. The drugs work, but if they don't build the Ferrari, you've got to build the Ferrari first. So many brand new bodybuilders, they go to the drugs so soon, they really don't build the Ferrari. And you have a, you're playing around with water, if you will, your water variation from all the androgenic material and the GH. I really believe that paying protocol, training protocol, and paying attention to the reps, you can do far more in the gym like we used to without the chemicals and high androgenic material. But when, the, when you get off the androgens and all the, all the drugs, 20 years for my legs to reduce in size after training. I believe there's more cellular enhancement that can occur with training protocol and more sarcoplasm development uh, in water variation with the drugs. So the drugs really, is, it's, it's not really real muscle. It's throwing water around. And also the guys that do this, which is everybody, they choose compartmentalized training, machines rather than free weights and dumbbells and barbells main tools of our trade. If you, go, if you don't go back to the compound movements, multi-joint, multi-muscled movements, you have a compartmentalized look. I think modern day bodybuilders think about uh, the transformers. The goal in mind is look like a transformer, you know? Uh, inhuman, non-human character. Uh, and I think we're missing the balance and the synergy, synergy and the symmetry of the body that comes only from compound movements. So what do I teach the, the big girls from the Miss Olympia that used to be? And, Believe that, they, I, Iris Kyle won 10 times in a row, 10 Miss Olympia contests, and they cancel her sport. I Man, I'd be sort of hurt. They canceled the sport. But a lot of big monster girls that I, I, I think the world of them, they come to train. And what we do is we specialize on compound movements and variation of compound movements that uh, I actually made up along the way that bring in other muscles and achieve a more of a balanced look on stage, less compartmentalization. And... Around the world, most pro bodybuilders are saying to me, except for the fringe people, the fringe people mean guys that are wanting to get into the pros, are thinking about using less. Less is not always better. I mean, more is not always better. Less sometimes is better. If I got a, and I know we're not talking about drugs, but I get a feeling we're going to go there anyhow. For me, uh, I spent, I think, $300 maybe max on each Olympia drug wise that I entered. I mean, uh, Winstrol, 20 milligrams a day and uh, shot a DECA 100 milligrams a week. That was my 10-year solution to drug intervention with Mr. Olympia as far as steroids. That was it. I, don't, I never used testosterone in my life until recently, okay? As far as, what do you call it, as far as uh, uh, using testosterone to be getting old, if you will. But uh, what do they call that? I forget the word they use. There's a word they use in terms of uh, uh, using ster testosterone just to anti-aging process, if you will. But it wasn't about the drugs in the old days. It was about the reps and the mentality to, to give you a lot of answers to your one question. Okay, did I answer your question? Okay. Anything else? Anything you want to go? We only have about 20 minutes. Yes? What was your favorite post-workout meal or your favorite meal? My favorite meal, my favorite post-workout meal. Um, hmm. You know, my meal prep in the old days, I never did meal prep. I had tuna fish. I had three cans of tuna in this pocket. I had three apples. 
I had a can opener and a fork and a napkin here, and I went to school. Okay, meal prep was tuna. Uh, so I never had this elaborate meal prep. Uh, I used to be in my Volkswagen, and I'd squirt the oil out of the can and, and while I'm driving, you know, out of the window, oil, and I'd eat my tuna fish in the car. That was my, that was my meal. My favorite meal was probably, you know, the morning breakfast, you know. But early in the morning before I went to the gym was two Pop-Tarts and a cup of coffee. Two Pop-Tarts, and the chocolate ones are lower in fat. But I found in 95 uh, I did better on using more dietary fat. Uh, I, should re I should probably think back a little bit with you. In the 70s we all did what Arnold did. So we all did meat and water diets, low carb diets, high fat diets. I did very well in my early years on that kind of approach. But it wasn't until uh, 1980 uh, with the influence of Mike Menser I decided to go on high carbs and low fat. And that was, the, that was shockingly unbelievable to my system. By switching metabolisms from high fat uh, to low carbs to high carbs, low fat, everything changed. I went to the Mr. Olympia in 81 and in 1980, and my whole career changed, my whole body changed. Now I'm getting in shape 20 pounds heavier and on 300 grams of carbohydrates a day. It was amazing. I think the secret is in switching metabolisms, which most people do nowadays. They actually switch metabolisms from high carbs to low fat and back and forth again. I think there's a secret in that for sure. But my favorite meal to answer your question, I used to make a big, I didn't eat that much back in the old days. Uh, I would have maybe, uh, you know, uh, a chicken breast. Uh, I, don't, I think the chicken wings and legs are better though, by the way. Chicken thighs are better. There's dark, the dark meat, there's more nutrition. The chicken skin is good. I believe in butter now. Butter is very important. doesn't have to be digested by the breakdown, breakdown by the liver. It goes right to the bloodstream. If I had to do it all over again, I'd be having butter every day, uh, like I did in 1995. 1995, I decided to put the fat back in uh, with some carbs, uh, keep my carbs high, I brought the fat up, and I got in better condition in 95 than I did back in the 80s. In fact, people confuse my 1995 condition with the 80s condition. But I, I don't really about a favorite meal. I always liked eggs sunny side up for breakfast with bacon. You know, the taste of that, the feeling of that. Uh, I used to have uh, a glass of white wine with my little chicken in the afternoon and my little bit of rice. I, I made a big deal out of 300 calories. I didn't eat as much as people eat nowadays. I, if I may say so, I think most bodybuilders eat too much. They're eating six, eight times a day, get in the middle of the night. Coleman used to get up in the middle of the night and eat a meal. I'm like, oh my God, I mean, I, I'm into, it's like we used to be into to, to bodybuilding for me was like hot rods, you know, the sexy Corvettes. Now bodybuilding is about the funny cars. I appreciate funny cars, but I think we all want to go back to hot rods. I think the guys and a lot of the girls are too big and they push, push their limitation so much that we're, we're not looking, we're not seeing the aesthetics anymore. We're seeing a bunch of bulky, sort of compartmentalized uh, situations on physiques that is sort of somebody else's idea too. And the coaches sort of put piece together. It looks like it's all pieced together not unity of flowing of body parts. So I'm giving you a lot of answers, to, if you will, to your question again. Um, but my favorite meal was making a big deal out of something small. I would have a little evening meal and I would make it last a long time and eat slow. Bodybuilders don't eat slow. Now they, eat, they eat too fast. No wonder everybody has digestive problems and hernias and all that stuff. You know? No wonder if they eat that stomach problems. You can't eat that fast. You gotta chew your food. Digestion begins here. You know, when you get older, you start thinking about these things. You go, oh man, we were doing everything so fast and so much, sometimes less is more in all things, okay? And I don't know if that makes sense to you, but that's what I've learned. Different than the pain of a joint, joint pain. If I get a joint pain, I'm out of there. I'm out of there right away. My, my way of training is I pretend I have a wet towel. I want every drop out of that towel. I won't give, up, I won't give it up until I get every single drop out of the towel in terms of my training a muscle, a given muscle. That's the way I look at it, you know? I want to get every single drop out. I won't leave anything left. And it's worked for me, uh, based upon my fiber type, okay, and body type. Um, did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay, good. Where else? Where else? Take me there now, otherwise I may not do it. Yes, sir. Yeah. Did you choose your uh, exercises um, more instinctively or by a by a Did I choose my exercises instinctively? Yeah. I believe that if an exercise doesn't have a risk, it's not worth doing. <laughs> okay, I mean, squats are hard. You're like balancing the bar on your back. You're out in the open space. You, have to, you can fall down. It's scary. It's risky. 
That's why it works. If you do it in the Smith machine, you, a guide rod. Uh, if you do it in the Smith machine, it's not a good idea. I would never suggest squatting in the Smith machine because there's, there's no movement at all of the, you know, of the torso and all the stress goes to the knees. So I think that the scarier an exercise is, the better it is. Now, I'm, I'm looking at benefit to risk, rate, benefit to risk. If risk is up here and benefits down there, no. I don't, I don't believe in committing suicide. I and mean, I talk to guys all along. Oh, I blew my intestines out swatting. I'm like, what? I mean, that's crazy. This is not, we're not out to commit suicide in the gym. But taking a risk, oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you have to take a risk and you have to do an exercise that's, that's hard to do. And so I select all the exercises I select are the ones that that are most difficult to do, the, the most compound movements and things like that. Even everything I do is an inherent compound movement. I just don't isolate one muscle. Even when I do tricep push downs, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a type of movement to where I'm using many muscles at one time. Even my calves. When I'm doing pull downs, my calves are getting pumped up and my leg biceps are getting pumped up. I put every muscle into every movement. And that's the way I generate my technique. Okay, and when I teach somebody, I do the same thing. Uh, you have to come to the seminar to know what I mean exactly, okay? Yes, sir? Um, what is your opinion on weight belts? You've got to use a weight belt. Uh, when, not right away, not right all the time, but once the weight goes up to, like, uh, on squats, for instance, when it gets to be, a, they do increase intra-abdominal pressure. Uh, the intra-abdominal pressure gives you more force production, okay? But you can't use a belt all the time. I would wait till you're about 65 to 75 percent of your 1RM before the belt comes on. I would not use a belt for back training. You need to be more move, more pliable, more move to get the most out of the contraction. So, I mean, when I say back training, I use a, I use a belt for T-bar rows, but I would not use a belt uh, for, like, seated cable rows or pull-downs, okay? Deadlifts, I've used a belt, oh yeah, over the years, yeah, yeah. When I was squatting the first week of the month and the fourth week of the, fourth week of the month, I would usually squat, uh, I'm sorry, deadlift about two and a half weeks into the month. I could not do more than that, to answer your question regarding intensity and workload uh, and frequency. If I have one good deadlift session per month and two squat sessions per month, that's it. That was my strongest and my most intensity, okay? And early on in my career, it was squatting you know, twice a week, but my intensity was so low. I was just learning the technique, okay? Did you also go for reps when you deadlift? Uh, when I deadlift, yeah. I remember doing, I have dreams about this still. Uh, you know, every, every Olympia, I still can't sleep, okay? I'm, it's been 37 years, I still can't sleep Olympia time in September. But I used to do, I remember doing 405 for sets of 50 reps, uh, 700 pounds uh, for like sets of five and six and seven reps. This was after the back workout. We'd train an hour and a half of back work, r roughly, would come to that point, and would do the deadlift at the very end of the workout. To me, that was very meaningful, and it worked really well at that time. But the deadlifting wasn't my central theme exercise like squats. Squats was far more effective for me as far as a compound movement, if you will. But I did deadlifts. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember Casey Vieter in the gym and Mike Menser in the gym. It was like crazy. That was my influence, you know. These guys were nuts. You know, when they retired, somebody's got to carry it forward, and that was me, okay? But they taught me a lot about that. Was that a train? Really? Yep. Out of a thunderstorm? Okay. Don't worry. We're okay? All right. Uh, okay. What was the biggest success in your bodybuilding career and the biggest mistake in your bodybuilding career for you? <laughs> Whew. Biggest success, biggest mistake. Uh, wow. The 81 Olympia was like, uh, I'll never forget that night. I would train 25 more years for one more night like that. No money. Forget about money. It's just, you can't buy that feeling. I mean, 86 was my last year. Probably the best time I ever had on stage. I mean, I think I did five encores at a contest. And I walked off the stage and... Uh, and, and I looked, I looked at Arnold, and Arnold's like, oh my God! From one performer to another, it's like, what the hell? That's, it's, it's, it's what you want. It's not about the money, or it's about that connection, that symbiotic relationship with an audience, to where the whole audience was like one person. I'll never forget that night. Um, those were my successes in terms of you know, Olympia, Mr. Olympia competitions. Uh, 
My biggest mistake. I'm trying to think of my biggest mistake. My biggest mistake. I really don't know. <laughs> um, probably trying to do what everybody else did and get the same results. And I, I made that mistake early on, you know, copying people. And I, I needed to find, I needed to question science and question myself and try things that nobody else did. Try the things that everybody else, was, everybody else would say was wrong. And when people told me I was wrong about something, I did it anyhow. Uh, I maybe not doing that soon enough. I waited until I was just a, you know, a, a new pro before I did those things. I should have did it early on, okay, not just did what's conventional. Um, but those are some of the things I think about in reference to your question. Um, yeah. Other question. One more question. We'll go. So I would say, um, I would say we have more three questions. Yeah, we come langsam to end. Three, uh, three more questions. Three. Yeah, one over here. Okay. Übrigens, ihr seid ein äh, super Publikum soweit. Okay. Ganz brav, okay. leise. Wir haben nur einen Telefonring in dem ganzen Seminar. So that's really? Pretty good, thank you. I didn't even hear it. Ja, ich habe eine Frage. Okay. Wie bekommt ihr den Namen The Golden Eagle? Ist es von der Crowd oder einer speziellen Person? Hm. <laughs> 1980. Ich bin auf dem Plan going over to the Olympia in Australia. Okay, my second Olympia. To back up a little, remember 79. When I was a little boy, I had all the top bodybuilders, their posters on my bedroom wall, okay? And in 79, I was eligible to compete in the Mr. Olympia. And I was like, do I deserve to be here with all the guys that are my heroes and my mentor figures, you know? I wasn't ready to be a new pro yet. I was like insecure, like Sergio Jr. Okay, so I told Sergio Jr., don't wait three years like I did, just do it now. But I'm going over to the 80 Olympia in Australia. I'm on the plane, a long plane ride from L.A. And uh, somebody gave me a book to read, which I read. And it was um, Jonathan Livingston Siegel. And it, it changed the way I viewed certain things from a philo 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 philosophical standpoint. You ever read Jonathan Livingston Siegel, the book? I forget who wrote that, but... It was a real good, quick read, very quick read. Uh, and it startled me. I even talked about it in the film that I did with Arnold in Australia. The, they called it, what, the comeback, uh, the Schwarzenegger and Platts movie or documentary, which I did back then. But I thought about this Jonathan Livingston Seagull book, and I thought, maybe it's something to do with the seagull, the golden seagull, and that too doesn't work. And then I came back home and I was redoing my marketing, my mail order pages. And uh, my dad said, how about the Golden Eagle? I said, I think that's it. And so I put it on my mail order. We had, you know, magazine <coughs> ads. We had pages that Joe Weider gave us. We could use for whatever we wanted to use them for. I uh, uh, put the Golden Eagle and it worked. People picked up on it and it became known as the Golden Eagle. I think it was a reference to the hair and the tan and the beach and all that stuff. But it, It worked very well over the years, but that's how it started, to give you the simple idea of how that started. Yeah, it was a very simple approach. It was actually fueled by the Jonathan Livingston Seagull, though. And I, I think about Jonathan Livingston Seagull when I hear the word eagle. An eagle, though, is like, you know, the American symbol, fly higher no matter what, keep going, even the eyes of failure. When it gets tough in this kind of altitude, go higher, you know? The eagle never stops. The eagle goes on forever. So the more I read about the eagle and the representation about the eagle, the more I said, yeah, that's my logo. That's what I want, okay? Which coincided with my belief system. Okay, so that was really my dad's help. My dad's helping me figure that out. I was young. I was a young pro. And he gave me that idea. Um, okay, two more questions. Two more questions and we'll break and we'll do pictures and stuff, right? Yeah. Do I see a hand? Oh, yes, sure. Yes. You remind me of when I was a kid, you know? He goes, he, go, he, he goes like, me? You know, when I was a little kid, I was walking around with my tuna fish and my apples. Big park, big coat, big orange coat. You know, big, driving a yellow Volkswagen, okay? And I'm in school. And I went to see, I went to visit, Arnold had a book, just came out, his new book, first book. And this big long line, and I'm in the back of the line going, wow, I'm going to get a chance to see this guy, okay? And... They must have told him about me being the local guy or something, you know. He goes, hey, in the orange coat, come here. I'm like, me? <laughs> and Arnold said, what's your career concept? What do you want to do with your life? 
I'm like, wow, isn't this cool? I couldn't talk. I'm like, um, Mr. Swanson, you're, yeah. I go, I'm gonna come out to California and train with you after graduation. When I graduate from school and have my degrees, I'm gonna come out and train with you. He's like, he blew me off, like, yeah, right, kid. <laughs> 25 weeks later, I'm there. Let's go, <laughs> let's go. Remember you invited me out? Yeah, I do. Oh my God, this guy's crazy, you know? But I had, I was that kid. I was that kid that's like, I want to know. I have to do this, you know? And he was willing to share things with me, his ideas and his training, you know? But yes, what's, what? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and probably didn't even have the supplements that we have today. Uh, so many people say it's maybe even more than 50% about the nutrition, not about the training. So, how do you think how important is nutrition actually, in your opinion, compared to the training itself? You've got to feed the body. But it's, as far as supplements, supplements are most supposed to supplement your diet. Food is your main choice of nutrients. That's never changed. Okay? But the thing is, like real protein supplements, real protein has a mommy, a daddy, and a face, okay? It doesn't come in a large tub, it doesn't have a 10-year half-life, okay? You gotta eat real food. And the food is your main source of recovery and of growth. You need to feed the body to grow and to recover. So when you don't grow in the gym. In the gym, you get weaker and smaller. When you're home resting and eating and sleeping is when you grow. Don't ever forget that, okay? But as far as supplements, you know, I work with a company right now, Old School Labs. Uh, I don't like supplement companies. I, I've been offered some really ridiculous money from supplement companies. I remember talking to my wife, I go, honey, what do you think? I mean, she go, I'm, I'm thinking, this is $200,000 a year. She's like, I don't like the guys though. I go, forget about it. I mean, I, well, I, I know it's like hard to do because I used to be about the money, you know. And I go, Beverly Hills, my ex-wives, you know. Okay? They we're all about the money. But like, at this point in our lives, it's like we want the right people. And we want the right company. I mean, there's only 14 companies worldwide that private label. There are 14 companies worldwide that actually do everybody's supplements. Okay? Supplements are supplements. And there's some things a little bit better than others, but the answer is not in the supplements. It's popular. Back in my day, really we didn't have, we had desiccated liver tablets that taste terrible, but we ate, I used to, 100 a day, 100 tablets a day, I would chew them, you know, and uh, it was real food. In fact, to this day, old school labs, they make a, you know, meat protein and an egg protein that I eat. I don't eat the whey protein, you gotta be kidding me, whey? That's the byproduct, that's the egg whites, forget, that's the leftovers from the chicken, that's, the, that's just the nothing. You know, the egg yolk is the, where, the, where the gold is. Uh, as far as protein supplements, I don't eat whey, it makes me gassy and bloaty and I walk around farting and stuff, it's like, you know, like, this is really, bodybuilders accept that as a given. You know, walking around like that, I'm like, Oh, it's okay, I'm a bodybuilder. I'm like, you're right. <laughs> okay, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I like the old days when we all got dressed up for shows. In the old days, when I was a little kid, guys, and you know, we all wore suits and ties to the show. It was special. It was a celebration of, of the gym, you know? Nowadays, it's, it's about the supplements. The supplement companies run the industry. I get it. I get it. And it's, it's a good thing, but also I think it's a bad thing. All, the old, all my old buddies that went to jail for selling steroids, they got, out of, they got out of jail and they opened up, they started supplement companies. That's really how it started. I shouldn't tell you that, okay? I, this, this is the truth. I mean, all, all these guys, are now, they just got out and they had the, you know, some money saved up from, from things and, and uh, they started supplement companies. Even the terminology, even the phrases are drug-like, you know, anabolic and all those words they use, constructive metabolism. But I think that <laughs> supplements are useful as long as they supplement the food. Okay, the food is your main source. That's never changed. It, it hasn't changed in all the guys that do the prep. I mean, all the guys in watching, you know, all the guys prep, it's like unbelievable. Uh, they eat some good food. I think they, the quality is, they go to Costco, these cheap places to buy food. I think food sources are important. That's why, another reason I'm in Europe. Food is better here. My wife does much better on good food. She's healthier. You know, she was having trouble walking when we were in LA. Now she's like running around and I'm like, this is great. Let's stay in Europe, okay? Hey, there's a lot of good things about Europe. You don't, you know, from my point of view, are much better here, okay? The food, the food source. I think food sources in the US were better back in the 70s. I really do. 
I think a lot of fake food, GMO, genetically modified food. Uh, we have a lot of that. Monsanto, I think a lot of problems with food. Uh, and I come here for the food. Yeah, food is wonderful here. Supplements are meant to supplement the food. And that's the way I looked at it. And there's no one thing. I mean, the food is important, um, for sure. Uh, but, you know, you've got to train. You've got to have the right mental approach. But uh, as far as supplements, uh, I, I never looked at them as like a necessary item. Uh, with old school labs, my wife and I actually like the people. We, we like the people. We like the thought process. They don't make a whey protein, so I'm in. <laughs> okay. Hope I answered your question. Yes, sir. What's your opinion on doing cardio in the diet? Good question. All the good questions come out now. Um, I think cardio is the worst choice for fat loss. Okay? The worst choice there is for fat loss. You lose muscle real easy. What's popular isn't always right, and what's right isn't always popular. I think the best thing for fat loss and for constructive metabolism is breathing squats. Big weights for high reps with perfect technique. Man, you never need to do cardio again. Okay? If you squat really like you're supposed to squat, and you really get into the reps, oh man, the cardio becomes meaningless and a waste of time. Okay, and I, I could go on and on and on about the cardio, but I think that's, that's one of the big mistakes in bodybuilding. And then again, a lot of the top pros, they have 20 pounds of muscle to lose. What the hell? I lose 20 pounds of muscle getting in shape at the Olympia. There's a better way, there's a better way, okay? Um, we used to lay on the beach for three hours a day and increase the core temperature. That's better than cardio, okay? <laughs> I had Sergio Oliva Jr. I, I told him I told him a story about we used to go in the water every you know every hour to flip sides on the beach and go in the water. The water would tighten our skin up. I had him go and taking uh, salt baths, you know, not in the ocean, but upstairs in his bathtub. So that some of the old school stuff does work, you know, most definitely. But nothing replaces good old fashioned squatting for reps. Oh man, forget about cardio. Do you have another question? Was that it? Okay, one last question. Yes, sir. Um, what do you think of the reason? People nowadays don't um, train so hard as you in the back of the I think the work ethic is no longer, people, why don't people train as hard as they used to? I, I think work ethic, I think the, the millennials, like when I was in the corporate recruiter, I would talk to thousands of young men and women, and maybe I would hire five, ten people out of thousand, okay? The work ethic, the, the sense of entitlement, everybody wanted a job, they wanted a high paying job right away, nobody wanted to do the work. I'm not criticizing millennials, but I'm just saying, in my day, if you get a job interview, you show up on your deathbed, you know, this is a job, you know, and now, oh, it's raining outside, can we reschedule, okay? So I had to talk to young people, I had to talk to, young, the way I talk to young bodybuilders, and when I was leaving, resigned from my corporate position, I can see different department heads, I go, I hired these men and women here to be here. It was like, it was like bodybuilding to me, it was hard to leave the organization, but staying with your, your, your question, I think that we have a lot more genetically gifted talents, athletes in the gym than before they used to go to the field. Rather than all these great athletes going to the field, now they come to the gym. And I think results happen a little bit easier. They don't have to work as hard. Uh, you guys like, uh, well, myofibril cell division occurs up to one's genetic limit. I can look at genetics. I can look at them. I'm not going to pay attention to it anyhow. Though. Myofibril cell division, your ability to uh, induce hypertrophy will happen up to one's genetic limit. Like when I was working with Lee Priest, he would, he would grow, anything he did, he would grow. Samir Banut's that way too. Go to the gym, just do anything. Boom, great, you know. A guy that talented. Uh, when I was training with Samir, I had to make him think about, I, I made him think I didn't like him. Because we were on stage, he, he was uneasy, okay. To this day, he still would talk about it, but it's hard to compete with that kind of guy, very talented. But I think a lot of modern day athletes uh, don't have the work ethic and the desire. In my day, it was either become a priest or a bodybuilder. That kind of life devotion. I would give my entire life, God, to this, ex to this exercise and this whatever it is I chose to do in life. And I did. I mean, there's no holding back. There's no playing around. There's no just doing it for Facebook or Instagram, you know. This was like... Training to me was life and death, and I gave it that much. In fact, many times my wife will tell you, I came close to death. Crazy, I give, gave it that much, and was it worth it? Hell yes, absolutely. I would do it again in a heartbeat, and still do on some weekends with 20-year-old guys I train, okay? And sometimes it's, I, I go, well, what am I doing, you know? But uh, I like giving it that much. When, you, when you're totally spent, Man, the feeling is wonderful. There's nothing you can't do. You just, when you give it that much to, to something, 
you feel good about yourself. And that's what I promised myself after Coach Smith kicked me. I'm never going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be, I'm going to be totally spent on everything I do. If I give everything I got, I can't lose because I can't give anymore. I'll keep finding ways to give more. And I was rewarded with a lifetime career from giving it that much. Certainly didn't get the Olympia, but I got everything else. Okay. So I think that a lot of the gifted athletes in the gym get results easier than we used to. We were just, we were the rejects in the gym. We weren't the gifted athletes on the field. And we had, a, we, had a, we had to really train hard. Now some of the modern day guys and, and girls can, don't have to train as hard. I don't think anything, nothing's changed in the body. Supplements haven't given them. The drugs are the same thing they used to be, just different names. Now it's what? Trend and all that stuff. Back in my day it was Dianabol, you know, and Winstrol and Deca. And nowadays everybody's into some magical substance and preparation. I think we're doing too much, too much stuff. We're not, we go, we had to go back to the training, back to the reps, back to the rep squats is where things happen and everything else happens from there. Okay. And I think that's where life begins in the gym as far as the squat rack. And I've said that in, in you know, on the social media many, many times. I mean that when I say something on social media, it's not just for hype. This is my life's work. This is my life. This is the reason I do live. Okay. The reason I'm allowed to live is because I'm supposed to be this guy, I guess, I guess. And my career chose me. I didn't choose it. I didn't choose it. There was no choice. To one last part. I remember when I was winning the Mr. Michigan contest. Chris Dickerson, you know Chris Dickerson? He won the Mr. Olympia. And he was involved in high society. New York, uh, the very, very wealthy of New York City. He knew everybody from all the Ivy League colleges. And I'm just getting ready to go to college, right? And Chris Dickerson's a little bit older than me. He goes, would you like to go to Princeton? Princeton University. I'm like, wow, Princeton? I didn't, never saw myself at, a, at an Ivy League college. Uh, we went through the process of getting into admissions and I would have been accepted to Princeton. I said, no, no, I'm not gonna go to Princeton. I'm going to California. I'm gonna go to Michigan State and I'm gonna go to Wayne State. I'm gonna go to California. And then sometimes I look back and I go, yeah, I could have, I should have an Ivy League college, but I'd probably be you know, divorced three more times and making a bunch more money and be unhappy. I chose what I love to do. I loved to train. I figured there was no money in it back then, but it was what I was willing and what I devoted my life to. Nobody devotes their life to something anymore. It's temporary. Even jobs. Nobody stays at one job. We all float around to different jobs. When I was recruiting, the average life is three to four years in one job before you go to the next company, the next company, the next company. My dad stayed with one company for 50 years, got a gold watch and retired. You know That doesn't happen anymore. So I think everybody has a temporary attitude. Temporary. Uh, we, we never knew what temporary was. When I was a little kid and decided to go into bodybuilding, this is, if I'm not going to be a priest, I'm going to do this. And I'm going to give it that much of my life meaning and my life devotion. Okay? And that's where the results were. When you give that much to, your, to something, you get a lot, a lot back. And I did. In any event, I want to thank you all very much for your attention. We'll be, thank you all very much. Thank you. Without your energy, I, we can never do this. Okay, your energy, I'm just paying you back for what your dad and your mom gave to me. So thank you all. Thank you. Wie war's? Wunderschön. Ja? Yeah? Wunderschön. Ein sehr motivierender Herr, ähm, wo ich das erste Video mit ihm gesehen habe und mich ein bisschen an mich selbst erinnert. Meine Jünger hier, die hier um mich rumsitzen, die, die wissen, wie ich sie immer anschreie. Nicht David. Ist er, so, ist er so schlimm? Ja, ja schlimm. <lacht> ja, also man, man merkt, er liebt den Sport und er würde auch für den Sto Sport sterben. Also ich sehe da so ein bisschen einen seelischen Verwandten. Also ich würde ihn gerne mal ein bisschen näher kennenlernen, vielleicht irgendwann in der Zukunft. Und auch mal mich von ihm quälen lassen, weil ich finde immer seltener Athleten, die auch mich mal anschreien. Nicht wahr, Nils? Also war sehr gut heute und jetzt wird noch ein bisschen trainiert. Matze, für was ist denn das eigentlich? Für Rap One wieder? Natürlich. Okay, Echt? Sonst? Mensch, jetzt werden sogar zwei Kameras auf mich gerichtet. Guck mal, zack, zack. Guck mal, zack, zack. Ja, war sehr schön. Es ging jetzt auch über zwei Stunden, war auch nicht langweilig oder irgendwie zäh. Man merkt, der Mann hat was erlebt, durchgemacht. 
Ist irgendwie verwirrend, dass die Kamera so nah an mich ran ist. Gell? Das ist ein Weitwinkel, keine Sorge. Ach so, also ja. wie letztes Mal, okay. Ja, also ich bin sehr positiv überrascht. Man nimmt auch mehr mit wie nur reine Trainingsphilosophie und so weiter, oder? Man fühlt sich, als könnte man härter trainieren. Ich glaube, viele sind hier sehr motiviert, die hier rausgehen. Ihre Blicke so hoffnungsvoll. Hast du gesehen? Ja klar, habe ich ja gerade geschenkt bekommen. Da sind ganze Packen drin. Nur Roland? Ja, ja. Das richtig geile Dinger hier von Chris Land noch. Oh, das an. Das ist brutal, gell? Halle ist leer, die Gäste sind weg. Wie zufrieden, ist, die Kamera ins Gesicht. Wie zufrieden ist der richtige Moment? Wie zufrieden ist der Gastgeber? Ja, sehr. War geil. War ziemlich voll, ne? Bei den anderen Terminen da in England und so waren 40, 50 Leute. Hier waren so 250. Publikum war super, alle äh, ganz leise gewesen. Einmal nur hat ein Handy geklingelt in zwei Stunden, das ist schon beeindruckend. Und äh, Tom war auch gut in Form, würde ich sagen. Ja, jetzt muss er noch, äh, dann hat er noch mit jedem ein Bild gemacht, das hat jetzt auch noch über eine Stunde gedauert, eineinhalb fast. Und äh, jetzt muss er noch ein paar Leute trainieren, also ein straffer, straffer Tag für den Tom, aber er ist ja ein Profi hier. Ja? Durch und ich durch. Bin, ich bin zufrieden, alles liebe Helfer dabei gehabt. Ne? <lacht> Ja, super. Also eine Wiederholung ist theoretisch möglich oder könnte es Ja, rein theoretisch, aber das ist ja jetzt auch, das war ja ein enges Zeitfenster. Die Halle ist gestern fertig geworden, so in dem Zustand. Und in ein paar Wochen steht hier alles voll mit Maschinen. Also dann wäre es auch wieder schwer gewesen. Von daher, das nächste Mal muss ich das dann irgendwo anders machen, weil dann wird hier alles voll stehen mit Eisen. Ja. Könnte man sich ja mal an die Stadt Weißen Turm wenden, ob die nicht eine schöne Halle mal haben oder so? Ja, also grundsätzlich sowas, so Seminar oder so mit dem Gast und so Kram. Ja, also ich hätte auch locker 500 Leute hier reinbekommen, von der, von der Nachfrage her. Ähm, da kann man bestimmt noch mal was machen. Ja. Geschenke habe ich bekommen. Ja, ah, ich glaube, das war hier noch mal Muss ich jetzt noch, muss Tom noch unterschreiben jetzt. Ist ja klar. Ja. Sonst gibt es kein Abendessen. Ja. 